What's going on ladies and gentlemen, it is Michael here with Scott and today we're proud to present you with our latest ideal game video, the ideal Elder Scrolls 6 Hammerfell. There has been a lot of debate as to where Elder Scrolls 6 will be set. Some people are sure it will be set in the sandy warrior culture province of the Red Guards, while others have their bets placed on the mountains, forests and badlands of High Rock, a game allowing you to explore Breton society and their kingdoms. Others predict that Elder Scrolls 6 seems to be quite ambitious. So so much so that Elder Scrolls 6 will take place in both provinces, giving you more exploration than ever before. Here at Fudge Muppet, we plan to brainstorm all of these videos, and today the focus is on a game entirely set in Hammerfell. Speaking of brainstorming, we had so much fun sharing our ideas for this video with you on our YouTube stream, and we'd love to discuss more ideas for other ideal game videos soon. So if you're quite creative and you want to kind of bounce ideas around with us live, be sure to come to our next stream. Times will be announced on my Twitter, linked in the description below with the timestamps. Also, we've made separate videos discussing topics like new skills, improved mechanics, and so on, so we're not going to have an entire video section dedicated to it. We want to focus on fleshing out the world of this game, the factions, locations, story, quests, choices and consequences, and so on. However, do stay tuned for a future related video because we do want to upgrade some of the mechanics decisions that we talked about in our ideal Elder Scrolls 6 video all the way back from 2014. Also, if you love this content, and you want to help support the channel while getting a sweet piece of merch in the process, we've just released a brand new Fudge Muppet tee with logo designs available on all kinds of apparel and even on phone cases. The black t-shirts are my favorite. So if you want to get this sensational stylized logo design on your skin, but you don't have the heart to get it tattooed, check out the Teespring link in the description below. And thank you so much for making what we do possible. If you enjoy this video, be sure to leave a like and a comment so we know you want more. And please do consider to sharing this with Bethesda and telling them which things you believe they need to implement. Now let's draw our curved swords and gallop straight into this video piece, uncovering what this game is all about as Scott sets up this brand new immersive world to explore. The year is 203 of the Fourth Era. The Empire is crumbling, the sinew holding it together is far stretched and straining. In Skyrim, civil war wages in a season unending. The dragon threat is gone, but the dragonborn has disappeared from the face of Nern, last seen wandering the northern lands of Solstheim. The Old Mary Dominion is stirring, waiting like a tiger for its chance to pounce and sink its teeth into the Empire once again. But among the lands of Tamriel, one stands strong, in stark defiance of larger powers than itself. That land is home to the Red Guards. That land is Hammerfell. When the Empire signs the White Gold Concordat and cowered before the Elves for fear of annihilation, they had the gall to abandon Hammerfell to fend for itself, a land and a people who would not lie down and accept the rulership of the Ultima. Like ancient battles with the left-handed Elves, the Red Guards faced down the armies of Myrrh, the once divided forebears, descendants of the warrior caste, and crowns, descendants of the aristocracy, were brought closer than ever before after the forebears of Sentinel helped break the Old Mary siege of the crown city Hagaith. This reconciliation between the two factions, combined with five years of bloody resistance, resulted in eventual triumph, forcing the Dominion into a treaty, the Second Treaty of Stross Mackay, signed in the year 180. Since this time, for 23 years, the Red Guards have proudly ruled themselves, bending the knee to no one, Empire or Dominion. However, it's important to note the lack of a High King, the last of which died during the conquest of Tiber Septum. The individual forebear and crown kingdoms swore fealty to the Empire, becoming vassals, but without the Empire, the centralization does not exist. Each kingdom is completely autonomous, with cultural obligations and allegiances to the political factions the forebears and the crowns, as well as a broader shared cultural identity with all of Hammerfell. But there is no crown's leader, nor forebears leader. It is helpful to think of them as cultural presets, rather than strict, defined factions. As a general rule, the crowns tend to be more traditional and conservative, preferring the old Yakutan pantheon of gods, whereas the forebears tend to be more cosmopolitan and open, preferring to worship the eight divines, deities Yakutan only in name. Among these kingdoms, you have many smaller factions scattered throughout. The various nomadic tribes of the Alakir, the Orcs of the New Orsinium, the Salatep Assassins, the 
Circle of Magi in Elan here, the vile Namira cult called Red Scuttle, the temples, the vampire clans, the sword singer revivalists, and knightly orders such as the Order of the Scarab and the Order of Diagna. We have an entire faction section dedicated to all of these, offering a much more in-depth explanation. So you understand the setup, now let's talk about the land of Hammerfell itself briefly. Yes, there is a lot of sand, but this land is not all desert like some may think. Mountains in the north, badlands, savannas, grasslands and forests, rivers and gorgeous beaches, and yes, of course, there is the infamous Alakir Desert in the west. Creatures such as assassin beetles, giant scorpions, crocodiles, jackals and harpies, dune racers, camels, daggerbacks and fennec foxes. There are many animals and creatures inhabiting the diverse biomes of this land. The city themselves are styled in a fashion similar to those of real-world North Africa and the Middle East. Expect ornate domed roofs, bazaars, mounds of spices, Persian-style rugs and drapery, buildings styled after places that exist in Morocco, Muslim Spain, Libya, Egypt, Iran, and ancient Mesopotamia. Think Babylon and Sumer. Expect the Red Guard dress to be decorative and diverse. Turbans, piercings, tattoos, African-style masks, light armors, cotton, silks, etc. We later dive into the map in much greater detail, talking about specific biomes, cities, settlements, and what's going on in all of them, but you should get the vibe of it all at a glance. As for the premise of the game, I think that it's best explained by the very next section, which is the opening to the Elder Scrolls 6 Hammerfell, followed by the story and plot. Remember, there are timestamps in the description which can be used to skip around from section to section, as well as the specific discussed factions, locations, and so on. So how does our game begin? What way would you have an Elder Scrolls 6 set in Hammerfell begin? Well, as a prisoner, of course, we can't bring ourselves to break the tradition, and it can often serve as a nice blank start. So let me try and set the scene. First, there is a character creation screen where you make your character's name, race, and appearance. It's a solid black all around you with some smoky effects for texture, and the lighting is perfectly even so that you can create your character perfectly. You then select Done and the game begins. It starts as a black screen. Slowly you start hearing the whistling wind and brushing of sand. You start hearing footsteps, the sound of step, and then the following sink and slide that happens in the sand. The screen is still black. It's been seven seconds. You hear people speaking in an unidentifiable language. It's Yoku, the ancient Yakutan language. You hear camels grunting and being packed with luggage. Footsteps come closer. The screen is still black. The footsteps get louder and louder, then stop. And with a giant thud, you are kicked awake. The early morning sun gleaming in the corner of your eyes. A heavily garbed red guard begins shouting at you in Yoku. He gets in front of you and reefs you up by rope bindings on your wrists. Your eyes are greeted by the many sands of the Alakir and the dunes that surround you with rocks jutting from them. You see various Alakir nomads packing camels, speaking in Yoku, getting ready to travel. The nomad that pulls you up ties your rope to his camel. Everyone mounts up except you, and you start walking at an uncomfortably fast pace, dragged behind the camel. You crest a sand dune and begin descending the other side, while the title Elder Scrolls VI Hammerfell appears on the screen and fades out again. As you descend, you are able to see the ocean in the distance, beyond some rocky, sandy scrubland. Suddenly, an arrow flies through the neck of the nomad rider that was riding the camel you're attached to. Redguard mounted swordsmen and archers charge over a dune to your right. The nomads and mounted redguards begin fighting, but the camel you're attached to panics and runs, ripping you off your feet, dragging you through the sands. Your breathing is heavy and panicked, and bang, you hit your head on a rock, knocking you out. A black screen, and then whoosh, you reawaken in a panic. You are underneath a tree, you can hear seagulls, and you can see the water shining in the mid-morning sun. You're closer to the ocean than you were. You turn to the right, Red Guard soldiers cleaning their swords of blood, feeding their horses. You look down at your hands, unbound. A Red Guard soldier begins walking over to you as he noticed you had awoken. Easy now, you've hit your head pretty hard. How'd you end up being captured by nomads? You say nothing as you stand up again and regain your composure, and before you could potentially respond, he says, No matter, look, I'm the captain of the guard in Ghislaine, just east of here. We've been looking for these nomads for days. They've been causing lots of trouble in the region. You're lucky Tuwaka doesn't want you yet, but if you stay out here like this with nothing but rags, you will surely meet him. Here, take this ribbon. If you hand this to Rag in the temple at Ghislaine, he will know I sent you. He'll help you out. 
He hands you an iron scimitar taken from one of the dead nomads. Don't get caught again, and when you see Rag, tell him Hanan said hi. The Red Guard Captain Hanan then mounts the horse and rides off to the west. Now here you are in the land of Hammerfell, about here on the map. The world is your oyster. You have nothing but the clothes on your back, a ribbon for Rag, and an iron scimitar. Not a gold piece to your name. Why, how, when you were captured by the Alakir nomads is all up to you. Why you were in Hammerfell is for you to decide. Now at this point you were the closest to the city of Gulane, and you have been pointed to go east towards it and meet with Rag in the temple. You do not have to if you do not want to. Instead go straight for Hagaith or straight into the Alakir desert. Do anything you like, but do so at your own fortune or peril. Taking the ribbon to Reg in Galane will begin to open up the main storyline, but it was really, really important for us to have a game beginning which does not have the same artificial sense of urgency as the previous two games. In Skyrim, it makes you feel like, quick, I need to tell the Jarl about the dragon threat now. In Oblivion, it's quick, get the amulet to Joffrey and close shut the gates of Oblivion. Whereas we believe the true appeal of these games is the open world and exploration, all the little things you can do, so we want the opening and the first part of the story to open up more slowly and allow you to explore what the world has to offer without encouraging you to rush your way from main quest to main quest. But of course, there will be parts of the story that escalate to urgency, but I guess now is a good time to talk about the main story and plot. Like we just said in the previous section, we don't want the story to be rushing you unnecessarily through it. We want to create an environment where you are encouraged to explore and take part in the world. So we need a story with lulls and peaks, pacing and slow escalation. I think as a template, we would use something like a three act structure. So the main story begins giving the ribbon to Rag in Ghislaine. Then it starts slowly and low key, encourages you to see what Ghislaine has to offer, as well as exposing you to a few new locations building up to the climax at the end of Act 1. And then once that is over, there will be a cool-off at the start of Act 2, a spot in the main story where it feels natural to spend some time going off and pursuing other things. The same deal as Act 1, as you pursue it, it would escalate to another climax and then cool off after. And with Act 3, there will be a natural break before it. But then I think the urgency will be picking up as you would expect. So with this kind of structure, you can choose to do whatever you like straight away with no pressure. But then if you do decide to pursue the main story, there would be two more main points in the story after Climax 1 and after Climax 2 where it feels very natural to take a break and go spend some time with all the side quests, faction storylines, exploration, etc. So speaking of story structure, let's actually talk about the plot itself, what it involves roughly. I'll try to break it down and split it into three acts, but do take note, the story would of course be far more meticulous and nuanced than what we can say here. This is already a massive video, so at certain points you will have to fill in the gaps as we say things like, there's a quest line here, and so on. But still, we lay it all out, so enjoy. So as you know by now, to really begin Act 1, you must take the ribbon you were given at the start of the game to Rag at the temple in Ghislaine. When you reach Ghislaine and you find the temple, you will find Rag, a Red Guard warrior priest, a devotee of eight divines, and veteran of the war with the Eldmiri Dominion. He was a valiant warrior, but he took his faith more seriously when he witnessed the devastating aftermath of the war with the elves. He took to charity and helping those who could not help themselves. Rag welcomes you with open arms, gifts you new clothes, and five gold pieces pieces, as well as offering you a place to sleep. If instead you choose not to do this for a long time, you have the option to say, Hanin gave me this, but I managed to sort my affairs out, and then it continues the same. As you go to leave the temple, a group of thuggish looking red guards come in, demanding that Rey give them the location of Esan. Esan is another of the priests at the temple, one with a bit of a gambling problem. Turns out he owes a bunch of money to the local kingpin, Baron Ulek, who also happens to be a noble third cousin of the King of Ghislaine. The following quest involves finding Esan and helping him settle his debt. To do this, you must help Baron Ulek with various tasks to pay off the debt, or help the returned Hanan, captain of the guard, take down the kingpin and have him jailed. Both outcomes lead you to meet a mysterious figure who was organizing a meeting for a deal with the Baron. If you sided with Baron Ulek, you go in his place with some of his men, or if you sided with the captain, you find out about the meet and go there with the captain and his men disguised as the Baron's men. Both ways get you inside the Yukudan ruins where it will take place. Here, the hooded, masked figure and his acolytes meet you. The mysterious leader, the 
the one you meet is in completely black robes and wraps, with long sleeves that go beyond his hands, and a mask that one could not possibly see through. There is a single hole over the mouth, and the pattern of the ceramic mask is made to look as if it were a whirlpool being sucked into the mouth. The acolytes spread throughout the ruins seem to be dressed and armed like the Alakir nomads, but instead they have distinct black garbs as opposed to the usual lighter colors and patterns. The leader walks towards you. It's very silent and atmospheric. You look straight at his creepy mask, and then suddenly he speaks in an unsettling, echoed voice. This one is not part of the equation. Remove it. The leader steps backwards and disappears through a magical portal that opened for him immediately. His acolytes close in on you and your allies, and you fight your way out of the ruins. Either the head henchman of the Baron or the captain, Harnan, reveals they found on the corpse of an acolyte this golden bar stamped with an unknown seal on it. Afterwards, you either report back to the Baron, or if you sided with the captain, you report to the King of Ghislaine. Both of them, depending on who you sided with, direct you to a woman named Juliet in Hagaith, a Breton merchant and banker. If there was someone who could possibly know where this gold came from, it was her. You head off to Hagaith, find Juliet, and she tells you that she has seen this seal before, used by pirates, especially in the Iliac Bay. It's pirate's gold, that's what the seal marks. She suggests seeking out passage to Stross Mackay and asking around there. When you arrive at Port Hunding in Stross Mackay, if you ask anyone about pirate's gold, most people will refuse to talk about it. But when you ask some of the shadier types, they will direct you to an Argonian named Yellowfish in the docks. Yellowfish turns out to be a fence for criminal types. He tells you that he did not sell any of this gold to any black robe cultists. His usual clientele aren't usually religious types. With some persuasion, threat, or favor offering, he will identify an Ultima merchant at Abba's Landing that will buy and sell in pirate's gold. You head to Abba's Landing, the free merchant city nestled in Hugh's Bane. So before we move on, the idea so far is that you can be introduced to the game in a pretty insular environment in and around Ghislaine, a forebear kingdom. You get a taste of the larger picture with the mysterious masked figure, and now you have an investigation that leads you to her game a crown kingdom, and then to Stross Mackay, a crown principality, both of which give you the chance to spend quite a bit of time there if you so choose. Now you're in Abba's Landing, where through the Ultima Merchant, you will identify who originally bought the gold you have, and through that, identify the cult hideout hidden in Hugh's Bane, with the help of a thief named Loris. You fight your way through the hideout and encounter the mysterious masked leader once again, surrounded by Dwemer machinery and automatons. The cult had been using the pirate's gold to buy black market Dwemer artifacts. He is accompanied by a single cultist who goes to his knees as the mysterious leader seems to breathe in his soul, sucking it from the cultist's body. He then turns to a modified Dwemer automaton he had constructed and breathes the soul into its core. Then once again he disappears through the portal. With the thief Loris you fight the Dwemer automaton boss, a giant modified centurion with a magical ward shield arm, fire breath, and a sword arm. Once you defeat this boss, you and Loris search the hideout and discover a secret passage hidden by a movable pillar. A private room for the leader is behind, with maps and notes, soul gems, and bits of Dwemer machinery midway through tinkering. Splayed out on the table was a Dwemer design of vast complexity. Loris advises you to find a Dwemer expert to decipher these notes, because whatever it is, it looks dangerous. So to give a quick recap, you go to Ghislaine, help Essan with his debt by helping the Baron or Captain of the Guard, you meet the mysterious leader, find the gold bar, go to Hagaith, get pointed to Stross Mackay, then get sent to Abba's Landing, with the help of a thief named Loris, you discover the cult's hideout, then you fight a modified Dwemer automaton made by the mysterious leader, you defeat the boss, and then discover the leader's secret room full of schematics and notes that seem to be designing some kind of new machinery. Now what we call Act 2 begins. Loris suggests you find an expert, someone who can decipher the notes, most of which is written in the Duomeris language. After asking, you are pointed in the direction of Ghislaine to speak to Yanaja, a red guard of the Circle of Magi, who is currently advising the king. She is a master scholar of ancient languages, and she should be able to tell you what they mean. When you get an audience with Yanaja, she asks for a favor in return. While she deciphers these schematics, you are to investigate a conspiracy to assassinate the King of Ghislaine. You seek out either the Captain of the Guard, Hanan, or Baron Ulek, depending on who you helped earlier, and either will help you in the investigation. 
This begins a series of short quests, the final of which involves discovering information that the assassination is to go down during a celebratory feast. You, Yanaja, and various guardsmen are on watch, protecting the king, and you cannot find any strangers who are not supposed to be there. Suddenly, there is a terrifying nasal roaring squeal, and a werebore emerged and began slaughtering its way to the king. This is a small boss fight, and when you kill the werebore, you investigate the corpse and find out that it was one of the servants from the kitchen. The evidence points to a greater conspiracy connected to the Thalmor, but it cannot be entirely proven. Regardless, the King of Ghislaine has been saved. Now that the King is safe, at least for now, Yanaja, while you are investigating and protecting the King, has deciphered the cult schematics and tells you that these are designs for what looks like a Dwemer superweapon, a weapon that could level an entire city in an instant. She urges you to stop the cult. She contacts the rest of the Circle of Magic and sets them on the task as well. As you leave the palace at Ghislaine, a messenger delivers you a note. It says to meet the sender where the Alakir meets the lands of Sentinel. It's from a nomad chieftain. You go to meet the nomad chief. He says to you that he has heard of your dealings with this mysterious cult and that he knows more about them. He goes on to explain that this mysterious leader with the mask has been recruiting from the tribes of the Alakir with the promise of restoring the sacred ancient ways for all of Hammerfell. This is why so many of the cult members are dressed like nomads but in black. They are nomad tribals recruited to this maniac's cause. The nomad chief, while he dislikes the degenerate Redguard kingdoms, he believes that this mysterious leader is unholy and his path far from the will of the gods. He wishes to stop this maniac recruiting from the tribes. He tells you that even his eldest son was swayed to the cause, so he must stop this. You ask him how, and he responds by saying that his greatest trackers have been surveying the cult's activity and have determined that they have a base of operation in Sentinel, but as a nomadic tribe of the Alakir, they would have a hard time gaining entrance to the city. Their peoples don't have the best of histories with one another. So you will go and investigate. You will discover that the captain of the guard in Sentinel has been swayed by the cult and has helped them create a window for the king of Sentinel to be killed. You warn the prince and Anton Guillaume, the Breton member of the Magi in service to the king. When you arrive at the throne room, realizing the guards have left their posts at the command of the corrupt captain, you charge in to find the mysterious leader grasping the king by the throat and sucking in his soul with the strange mask. The king is then dropped to the floor, dead. The prince and Anton burst in from another door, arriving too late. The masked leader turns to you and shouts, Anomaly! Staring right at you. He then instantly teleports through a portal, but Anton quickly casts a spell to hold open the portal and yells at you to follow him. He can only hold it briefly. You go through the portal and are teleported to a large stone room, with your only exit closing behind you. The mysterious masked leader turns to fight you and now ensues a boss battle. He uses all kinds of powerful magic, as well as a Kopesh sword seemingly made of Dwemer material. He refers to you as an anomaly and shouts that you must die, you are not part of the equation, all in his terrifying echoey voice. As you get him to half health, he is able to stun you and run from the room as a group of Dwemer spiders awaken and attack you. You beat them and follow him, fight your way through a few cult members in pursuit of the masked leader. You fight him again in another room higher up, getting him down to 10% health before he stuns you again and flees up the staircase. You follow him and it leads out into a vista of snowy mountains. You realize you are in a tower amongst the peaks of the Dragontail Mountains. You follow the trail of blood to the leader and see him hunched holding his arm, panting through his mask, creating the signature echo sound. He stops and speaks to you as the snowy winds gale and lightning storm brews. Anomaly, he shouts at you. Stop! Here he begins to speak to you. You can ask him all kinds of questions, but he remains cryptic and he reveals that his plan is in motion and cannot be stopped. You demand him to remove his mask, to which he states, are you sure? You cannot unsee what is seen. He pauses for a moment. Very well then. He reaches to remove his mask and reveals what lay beneath a red guard face but horrifyingly transformed. His lower face is brass jaw and in place of a mouth, 
five soul jam looking stones. His eyes are entirely white and bits of machinery that look like the legs of a Dwemer spider are bound into the sides of his face, looking as if they are straining to hold the skin onto his head. A horrifying visage. He shakes off his black robes, wraps and hood to reveal his full form. His gaping chest reveals a Dwemer dynamo core like those you would see in automatons. His body is a horrifying form of twisted bone, flesh and brass, crudely stitched skin stretching and binding this monstrosity together. I am inevitable. We must arrive at the sum. He falls backwards off the tower and as you look off the edge, you see a portal closing in midair. He had escaped. You take his mask from the ground and return to the Prince of Sentinel and Anton. With his father dead, the Prince is overwhelmed with grief, but he must soon prepare to take his place. You only have bad news, saying that the leader ultimately escaped. You hand Anton the mask and you tell him of his horrifying form, as well as all the talk about the equation and how you are an anomaly. Anton says that he will take the mask and consult his sources on what this means. He also notes that the prince has all his available resources working for him, all his spies reporting to him, looking for cult activity. He says he will contact you in two weeks. So in summary, you find Hyanaja, the Magi, and she says she will decipher the notes. You prevent the assassination of the King of Galane. You fight a werebore in the throne room. King is saved. Yanaja tells you the schematics are for a Dwemer superweapon that could level a whole city. You are contacted by a nomad chief who knows more about the cult, saying that they are recruiting from the nomad tribes with promise of return to the ancient ways for all of Hammerfell. He points you to Sentinel to hunt out the base of operations there. You find out about a plot to kill the King of Sentinel, but you arrive too late, yet you are able to follow the mysterious leader through the portal, you fight him, he ends up revealing his true form, and then he escapes. You return to Anton, and he says he will contact you in 14 days, which by the way means 14 in-game days, where you can either choose to just sleep or wait through them, or instead go and pursue some other quest lines or side quests, maybe just explore a little. So now Act 3 begins after the 14 days of game time has passed. The reason we thought it would be good to clearly give you this break is to allow you to stretch your legs and do what you like for a bit because Act 3 is going to pick up a lot and the urgency is going to accelerate so it may not feel natural to take a break midway through Act 3. Anton contacts you saying to meet him in a hidden location within the Tutambu forest to the east of Sentinel. When you arrive, you find a small hunter's shack guarded by two sentinel honor guards in disguise. They let you in and when inside, another guard directs you to go down a small hatch, which opens up into a secret basement. Inside, you find Anton with a red guard man strapped to a rack, bruised and bloody. Anton tells you they managed to find this high-ranking cult member who had recently defected. From the information they tortured out of him, it seems that the mysterious leader killed the king of sentinel and took his soul so that he could call upon the king's ancestor, an ancient Yakudan sword singer. The ancestor's soul is at rest in a Yakudan tomb located roughly between Elenhir Rehard and Skaven. It's a very powerful soul which will then be used to power the Dwemer superweapon, which apparently is being constructed deep within a hidden network of Dwemer ruins accessed via the ancient Dwemer city called Volenfell, capital of the Rorkin clan. Additionally, it turns out that the cult member being tortured who gave up this information is the son of the nomad chief who previously helped you. Here you can decide whether to kill the son or release him back to his father, and this would determine whether or not a side quest line is available from the Nomad Chief later on. Regardless, while Anton and the Prince of Sentinel gather to take a force to Volenfell, your next move is to find the Yakudan Ruin, and when you find it, you fight your way through various members of the cult, as well as Dwemer automatons accompanying them. Eventually, you find the final chamber is blocked off and forced shut, but you find a side entrance through another passage that leads to a surrounding balcony, and you bear witness to the unmasked leader of the cult speaking with an ancient Yakudan spectre. The room is lined with a few cultist guards. The Yakut Inspector says, You are not of my blood. How have you summoned me? I demand your name. The leader is standing there, bare-chested, wearing only Arabian-style harem pants, like you would see on Aladdin, for example, but they're dark red. I am Zamayad. My blood is not important, but my mind. My mind contains the keys to our chains, the liberation of our souls. For over a thousand years, I have calculated the perfect equation. Prophecies, determined events, the ripples of causality, they all point to one perfect moment. A moment where the world of Lorcan, of Sep, of Shaw, is unraveled, the mortal coil unbound. Sacrilege! 
The Yakut inspector replies, but is quickly cut off by the leader. I don't need your approval. I will, however, need your soul. In one great breath, Zamayad sucks in the soul of the spectre absorbed into the soul gem in his mouth. The leader then turns, looking around the room. I know you're here, Anomaly. I recalculated since our last meeting. The equation has you accounted for. You can't stop me. I am inevitable. I will complete the work of the Deep Elves. I will do the work the Cabals of Somerset wish they could, but without the need of towers. Why spend time knocking the spokes of a wheel when you can just break the center? Now it is revealed that Zamayad is not planning to use the Dwemer superweapon to merely eliminate cities and return Hammerfell to the ancient ways, he is going to use it to undo Mundus, to dissolve the mortal realm. I leave you with a parting gift. Zamayad raises his hands and purple energy shoots out, flying towards the various coffins around the room. He then creates a portal and leaves. Various Yukutan mummies burst from their tombs and rise to attack you, as do cultist members. After you defeat the enemies, you walk to the central coffin where the Yukutan sword singer was buried. You search for any clues, but then you hear a hiss, and there lies a cobra. And before you can react, it latches onto your neck and injects its poison. Your sight fades and you're thrust into a vision that has you following a snake through the stars. It shows you flashes of ancient battles against left-handed elves in Yakuta. It shows the regatta carving its way through Hammerfell. It shows a Redguard family happy and in love with one another. It is showing you the meaning of the mortal world, the love, the triumph, the life, all made significant by the existence of loss and death. The contrast. You reawaken, and the cobra shows you a secret passage out of the tomb. Whether this was a psychoactive venom that gave you a hell of a trip, or whether it was Sep slash Lorcan sending you a vision, that's for you to decide. Regardless, you emerge from the tomb and are met with the view of something awe-inspiring yet terrifying. Above the Alaki Desert to the west is a giant beam of rippling green energy that has shot into the sky, creating a rift to Aetherius that is growing larger and larger. It looks as if someone has ripped open the sky and near blinding blue light is shining through with sparkly blue gelatinous-like substances dripping out into the ground below. You now travel as fast as you can to Volenfell and you find a temporary camp set up before it. The prince or I should now say the King of Sentinel, is here with a small army, along with the Magi Anton, who himself is accompanied by some Elenhir battle mages. You get there and explain the revelation about the superweapon and Zamayad's real plan. They inform you that they have been trying to fight their way in and they got pretty far, but then a great beam shot from the sky and many Dwemer machines awoke and began helping the cultists fight back, so they had to retreat. It's at this point where an army comprised of forces from Ghislaine, Hagaith, Tanith, and Skaven arrive to reinforce and help carve their way into Volenfell. This is the epic final mission where you'll be entering Volenfell, a massive Dwemer ruin, fighting with an army through cultists and automatons. You navigate traps and fight your way through once hidden passages that lead to the chamber of the superweapon. What is left of your small army is now faced with a final boss, a Dwemer Colossus that guards the entrance to the superweapon chamber. Chamber. This Colossus is huge. It's a very intense battle, and what was left of the small army will have surely died. You enter the chamber, a massive hollow cylinder with a bridge across to the weapon itself pointing skyward. There are depths surrounding it, allowing for the sands of the desert to flow in without submerging the weapon. As you cross the bridge, you see this bronze mega structure up close, humming and flowing with fearsome energy. As you look up, you can see the sky. This kind of structure could have only been made with tonal architecture of the Dwemer. In the center of the spire-like weapon, you see Zamayad hooked up to it strewn with metal cables and machinery. The soul gems in his mouth area are humming intensely. This is where you walk to him, helpless, as he monologues you about how you defy the equation, how this is impossible, that you're an anomaly. How don't you realize that your convictions and perceptions are rooted in the mortal curse? And of course, because you gotta save the day, you ignore the hell out of him and you rip out the dynamo core in his gaping chest. And with that, you see purple energy stream out of his soul gem mouth, the souls are freed, and the machine deactivates. The beam stops flowing, and the rift that was tearing the mortal realm asunder begins closing. 
This is where you get to talk to all the various people and get closure, you get celebrated, yada yada, you get honored by the new king of Sentinel and gifted a boatload of riches. That's it, that's the main story over and you're free to continue exploring the wealth of content in Hammerfell. Now I want to sum this up by saying that it was our intention with this storyline not to have some prophesized hero story like where you're the dragonborn. We wanted to leave role playing room so that you can be an absolute nobody, you just happen to get in involved through seemingly unrelated events and are seen as an anomaly in the villain's plan. You weren't foretold by a prophecy, you possessed no special powers beyond your own skills, you simply were a factor that Zemayad's calculations didn't account for, resulting in his plan's failure. So the last little bit we wanted to mention was a little post-game fun. Well, you remember the material called Ethereum from the Dawnguard DLC? Well, essentially Ethereum is the glowy blue material that originated from Aetherius. The Dwemer who mined it in Skyrim ended up fighting over it and had an Ethereum forge that was used to craft with it. Well, we thought it would be cool if that the rift in the sky had allowed Ethereal Gloop to fall out and harden into shards of Ethereum scattered across the desert. Perhaps you can find the shards, which opens up a quest that involves some Dwemer researchers and perhaps discovering the Rorkin clan's attempt at replicating an Ethereum forge. Then the quest could involve you completing the forge with the help of the Dwemer researchers, and then you have the ability to craft a Ethereum artifacts like the shield, crown, and staff of Skyrim, but also some new varied artifacts and weapons. We just thought it would be a nice chunk of additional content after the main story is complete. Now it's time to explore all the factions we've come up with in more depth. Factions are one of the most exciting parts of any Elder Scrolls game, and they definitely help to facilitate a main aspect of the game, the feeling that you can go and be anyone you want to be. In our ideal Elder Scrolls 6, we'd want instances where there's more than one faction for a certain playstyle, so instead of having one magic guild that all mages have to join, there could be two with differing ideologies. This allows for character builds to join guilds with different morals while using the same playstyle, However, doing this isn't always necessary and we don't want to create so many different factions to facilitate every kind of character possible to the point where you end up with a huge list of joinable guilds but they all lack substance beneath the surface. So some playstyles may only have just the one main guild that fit, however in these guilds the player may have more agency. What I mean by this is that there may only be one thieves guild but as you progress in rank and gain more of a say in the guild, you might be able to make decisions to move the faction in one way or another. Depending depending on your philosophical views. Other factions would be more ideological or political, such as the Crowns and the Forebears, or more religious, such as various orders of Yakutan, Imperial, or Daedric worship. Some of these factions may not like each other, and if you proceed deeply into one, you may eventually reach a cutoff point where you won't be able to join an opposed faction. For example, if you are the leader of an Assassin's Guild, you'll be barred from gaining the blessings of various Aedric gods, and you'll be unable to join certain religious orders. That said, things will stay relatively accessible for the most part. There's a different balance with faction options in Elder Scrolls games versus Fallout games, and it wouldn't feel right, for example, if in Skyrim you couldn't go into Solitude and do quests there because you were associated with the Stormcloaks for helping out too much in Windhelm, and the guards just attack you on sight. It might feel realistic, but it just doesn't sit well with us for the exploration and adventure of a fun Elder Scrolls playthrough. We also prefer all of the factions discovered to be shown in your journal or menu, similarly to how they were in previous Elder Scrolls games. Here the player can see their rank in various guilds that they've joined, which is a feature we want to bring back as well as just any faction they've become a part of that may not have any ranks at all. With all of that said, let's dive into the factions and discuss what they're all about. So let's talk about a classic faction that for the first time in a major Elder Scrolls game will not be playing a main part or be in control of the province. We are of course talking about the Empire of Cyrodiil. Preceding the events of the Great War and the White Gold Concordat, Hammerfell was removed from the Empire, leaving the Empire with territories only in Cyrodiil, Skyrim and High Rock. Naturally, since the Empire essentially abandoned the Red Guards, the Empire is not held in high favour, yet there are those who still believe in the ideals of the Empire and hope to rejoin and perhaps even reform the Empire. Imperial sympathy will be scarce among Crown territories, but it can be found amongst Forebear nobles. Ultimately, the Empire is not a joinable faction and serves only to enhance the setting. You would meet many Red Guard veterans of the Great War and you would see some of the great battlefields and graves as a result of it. Perhaps you would even see some Imperial Breton or Nord veterans and soldiers that have come to pay homage or remembrance. Anyways, it's important to mention them, but let's move on to another familiar faction, the Thalmor. 
Like the Empire, the Thalmor will be playing a much, much smaller role in Hammerfell compared to that of Skyrim. Hammerfell is not part of the Empire, and the Red Guards fought and defeated the Old Mirror Dominion, forcing the Second Treaty of Stross Mackay. The High Elves slinked back to their homeland across the seas, and the Red Guards were victorious. As you could imagine, the Thalmor would not be popular at all, and it would not be the case as with Skyrim, where there is a Thalmor embassy and Justiciars roaming the land searching for Talos heretics. Instead, it is a quite hostile environment. If anything, the Red Guard's bad history with Elves, both recent with the Old Mirror Dominion and ancient with the left-handed Elves, has given them some severe prejudices, which of course varies from person to person, but is common enough that it is a problem for Elves. Perhaps Stross Mackay is the only place where Thalmor diplomats are ever found, perhaps trying to open trade or make deals, but I imagine their attempts would be unfruitful. The main way you would experience the Thalmor in the game would actually be through secret Thalmor agents who are hidden. It would be possible to do a side quest or a small series of side quests for them, but nothing huge. I thought it would be cool if you began doing a side quest for a Khajiit member of a caravan, what at first seems like a typical mercenary type mission. You find the goods and deliver it to the drop, only to find out at that moment that you were actually delivering an artifact to a Thalmor agent, and you had actually been unknowingly hired by a Khajiit Thalmor spy. He would have the choice to hand it over and get paid still, or you may instead keep the artifact and kill the agent, as well as turn in the Khajiit. But overall, once again, like the Empire, the Thalmor are playing a smaller role this time, serving mainly to facilitate the setting rather than be an active participant. We think heavy Thalmor presence would make a lot more sense in a High Rock game or in a multi-province game featuring Hammerfell and High Rock, and we'll probably be making ideal Elder Scrolls 6 videos for those games too. Okay, so let's talk about the two major political forces, or rather political cultures of Hammerfell. So the simplest, most basic of definitions states the crowns are the descendants of the Notatambu, that is the noble caste of Yakuda, and forebears are the descendants of the Regatta, the warrior wave that first came to Hammerfell and made way for the rest of the Yakudans. In the most general sense, the crowns are far more conservative and traditional, and they worship the Yakudan gods, whereas the forebears are far more adaptable and cosmopolitan, which has more or less led them to originally accept the Empire and the Eight Divines with some Red Guard naming, but we will get into the temples later. Now, it seems from what we can tell in the lore that the forebears and the crowns are not a political party in our democratic understanding of the term, or a solid block alliance or anything like that. It seems to be more of a loose cultural grouping based on heritage and values, meaning that forebear kingdoms usually ally with forebear kingdoms and crowns kingdoms with crowns kingdoms, but at the end of the day they are all still independent kingdoms with their own ambitions and reasons for various combinations of political stances. To help make the point clearer, look to Skyrim and Cyrodiil. Throughout history, Skyrim has generally culturally been divided into two halves. The Eastern Old Holds, places such as Winterhold, Windhelm, Dawnstar and Riften, and they are generally the more conservative holding on to strong Nordic traditions with no compromises as opposed to the more cosmopolitan, by Nordic standards, Western holds, places such as Markarth, Solitude, Morthal, and Whiterun, and more recently Falkreath, which by the way at various times in history has been considered part of the Kolovian estates. Now these holds are still run by individual autonomous Jarls who can fight amongst each other or ally with each other, and when they do, alliances don't always match up along these cultural lines perfectly, but as a general rule, the East and West holds have general cultural differences, but they are still individually autonomous. In Cyrodiil, it's the same with the esoteric, magical, mercantile Nibbanese of Eastern Cyrodiil and the staunch, proud, orthodox Colovians of Western Cyrodiil. These, like the forebears and crowns, are cultural and pseudo-political distinctions. Now, for these reasons, you will understand that there is no joinable crowns faction or joinable forebears faction. There are simply individual kingdoms of Hammerfell that are either forebears or crowns, which is a major factor in what their culture is likely to be. You can help individual kingdoms and perhaps even gain noble status where you can gain lands, titles and such, but just because you are in good with Hegaith does not mean that Skaven, another crown city, will also love you. Of course, each kingdom has its own individual crime system like each hold in Skyrim does. Now, the law isn't entirely clear on which cities and kingdoms of Hammerfell are definitively forebears or crowns. It is known that they even change hands from time to time, as is the case with Sentinel, but we have a 
essentially found all the canon mentions in the lore about whether they are crowns or forebears, and for the ones that require guesswork, well, we've made educated guesses to determine their status. What is generally said is that the crowns tend to be in the more isolated inland places, away from external influences, whereas the forebears tend to embrace trade and other cultures. For the crowns, we have the coastal city of Hergaith, as well as Stross Mackay, there is the inland Skaven, and the mountainous cities of Dragonstar and Elenhir. As for the forebears, their kingdoms make up most of the coastal regions. Sentinel is the largest of the cities, which harbors the Iliac Bay, and the cities of Galane and Tanith are both in the south on the water, and then further south towards the Gold Coast, you have the forebear city of Rehad. The other important cultural political entity of the Red Guards are the tribes of Alakir nomads. The Alakir Desert seems to begin just north of Hagaith, Galane, and stretching to below Sentinel. Within this vast space are many ruins and secrets to be found, but among them are the tribes of nomads that inhabit the land. Now for this group we have drawn a lot of inspirations from a very similar North African cultural group called the Tuaregs. We envision the Alakir nomads generally to be ultra, ultra conservative and traditional. They are exclusively Red Guard and maintain the Yakutan gods' worship, yet make zero compromises for luxury and wealth, as all kingdoms would. They live their traditional, spiritual, but harsh lives in the desert, riding their camels from oasis to oasis, migrating as per the seasons, setting up their camps. They have an intense raiding culture and treat all outsiders with disdain. They are quite the problem for the aforementioned kingdoms which bordered the Alakir, and it's not like the kingdoms can just send their armies into the desert, because the nomads are brilliant warriors and thrive in the extreme terrain. But what has occurred is that the kingdoms have instead enticed nomads away from the lifestyle and modernized certain tribes or individuals, offering them esteemed warrior positions. Examples of such can be seen in Skyrim. Kamatu and his Alaki warriors would have once been nomads when they were young that have now taken esteemed positions in Tanith. But as for the rest that have not abandoned tradition, generally those in the most remote parts of the Alakir, they live their lives to the traditional letter. It's also worth noting that their main god of worship is Satakal, the world skin. We thought it would be interesting if these Alaki nomads still considered themselves Yakutans and that most of them still speak the language Yoku, with only a few speaking the common Tamrielic. This would make it somewhat difficult for you as the player to interact with many of them, that is if they aren't hostile to begin with. Many groups will actively attack you whereas others will only attack you if you come close to their camp, but depending on your quest, your alliances, your skills, you can convince them to perhaps trade or talk with you. Experience will vary from tribe to tribe and ultimately we really want the Alaki nomads to have that indigenous, traditional and ancient feel, like the Ashlanders of Morrowind, the Skarl of Solstheim or the Reachmen of Eastern High Rock and Western Skyrim. But next to talk about, there is another political entity, another kingdom, but not a Redguard one, not Crown nor Forebear. We are talking about the city of Orcs, Orsinium. This is the fourth incarnation of Orsinium in Tamriel's history, and this time it's in a very different spot. Rather than High Rock, this time it's located in the mountains between Hammerfell and Skyrim, and we think the perfect spot for it is just to the east of Dragonstar, which itself presents a split between Hammerfell and Skyrim in terms of architecture and culture. Culture. The Red Guards with the Bretons have a long storied history with the Orcs. Gaiden Shinji, the legendary Red Guard warrior, was instrumental in the first sacking of Orsinium, and Red Guards have taken part in sieges pretty much every time Orsinium was built. Consider also in Red Guard mythology, the Regatta came to Hammerfell and fought many battles with goblins and their god Morlock, aka Malakath, or as the goblins call him, Mulak. So thematically, it would be really cool to experience Orsinium in Hammerfell, and perhaps it would be awesome to join with the forces of Dragonstar to siege Orsinium, or perhaps you could choose to defend it. Orsinium would also serve as a palate cleanser by offering an entirely different society to all the Redguard kingdoms. Being in Hammerfell, we would envision that Orsinium actually features a bunch more goblins, ogres, and other Malakath type outcasts. It'd be interesting to interact with goblin kind on a speaking basis rather than the screeching enemies of the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. I think it also makes sense that this time around, Malakath is the predominant god worshipped, considering the previous failures to implement widespread Trinomach worship. While there may be a few Trinomach worshippers, Malakath is far more predominant, or Mulak, as he is called by the Goblin Clans. This Orsinium's creation had a lot of help from the local Goblin Clans, the last of Hammerfell, that live in the mountainous caverns, as well as goblins migrating from Colovia. In fact, this Orsinium's population 
population is 50% goblin and 50% orcs, besides a few ogres and giants. Orc war parties often include an awesome captain with two orc warriors, six goblin warriors, and a support unit which is often an ogre, an armored troll, a welwa, a goblin shaman, or on rare occasion, a giant, perfect for sieges. This incarnation of Orsinium is very militaristic. Their leader, King Gorta, has learned from their history. Every time Orsinium is built, every time it is lured into a false sense of security with recognition and allies, it ends up destroyed. King Gorta believes Malakath's kind must stand on its own and carve out its own slice of Tamriel and hold it with bloody force. So it's time to talk about the faction of assassins. Who will you be joining to get your secret killing fix? Now, we actually danced with this idea a little bit in our Elder Scrolls 6 discussion, who will replace the Dark Brotherhood. In that video, we expressed our view that it would not really make sense for the Dark Brotherhood to be in Hammerfell if the game were to be set concurrently or shortly after the events of Skyrim, like this game is, and we really don't want to rebuild the faction kind of thing. So like how Morrowind had a unique assassin's faction, particular to the geography and culture culture of the land, we would want to make a Redguard Origin Assassin's Faction without the edgy kill for the sake of killing vibe. Not that we don't like that, but it can get old. We would like to see something fresh with new ideologies. This Assassin's Faction is called the Salatep. They revere only one god, the Yakudan god called Sep. In Yakudan mythology, Sep is analogous to Lorcan, and initially, to survive the Kelpic Cycles, the cycles where Satakal the Serpent eats his own tail until he consumes himself and then is reborn again, the gods had to use a method called the walkabout, a method devised by Ruptgar, or Tall Papa, aka the Yakutan version of Akatosh. So Sep set about to find an easier way of surviving the Kalpic cycles, so he with a bunch of the other spirits created Mundus, and those spirits became mortals, and then after which the perceived tyrant Ruptgar punished him, forcing Sep to swim about the void of the sky as he jealously tries to eat the stars. You could find out way more context in our complete guide to the gods video, but on with the assassins. So the founding premise of the Salatep was a secret society cult of Sep worshippers who directly oppose all the other Yakutan gods as well as their temples and worshippers. They believe in Sep's way, they seek the secret path, a way to live beyond the Kelpic cycles other than the walkabout of Ruptga. They seek a transcendence never considered by the servants of the Adric deities. The Salatep was founded in the early 2nd century of the 4th era by a radical dissident priest of the Yakutan temple, named Izar the Two-Tongued, named so because he would preach the Yakutan faith during the day to the masses, but in the middle of the night, he would gather with his dissident followers and plan to undermine the temple through infiltration. Izar himself rose to the position of high priest in Hagaith, and many of his followers inhabited lower positions in the temple. However, his secrets eventually came to light, and he would be violently tortured at the command of the king of Hagaith, year 123 of the Fourth Era. Izar was flayed alive and had his tongue split down the middle, showing the people the snake that he was, as they paraded him through the streets for all to see. But this had the opposite effect the pious king intended. You see, the Salatep and its priests had infiltrated traded the Yakutan priesthood, and they begun secretly converting the lower classes, the destitute peasantry, the shunned, all offered promise of a new way to salvation through the secret path of Sep. Izar had become a martyr, instead of instilling fear like the king intended. Izar's death only confirmed their beliefs, the nobility, and the temples were silencing the truth. Through Sep, they could find true freedom, they could transcend and overcome. Many more dissident priests were outed and executed, but others managed to remain within the priesthood secretly, spying and communicating with the rest of the Salatep. Izar the Two-Tongued has become their sacred symbol. The Salatep's seal is Izar, a flayed man with a tongue split in two, but made to look more like a snake's tongue. There is also a serpent meant to represent Sep that coils itself around his body. The Salatep was now known to the world, and they would now operate out of an ancient Yakutan tomb hidden within the kingdom of Skaven. This this was their main headquarters, where the leadership remained and the spies and assassins of high rank would be trained. This base is highly secretive and unknown to the majority of lower rank members within the Salatep. There are other hideouts dotted throughout Hammerfell that generally recruit from and preach to the people of the slums and areas of poverty to find in them loyal spies and assassins. The Salatep's lower ranks don't have much in the way of uniform, being assassins and spies and all, but that is not the case for the higher ranks that remain in the Salatep's main headquarters. Here lots more ceremonial dress is worn and official armor for the best of assassins, but the main 
identifier of a Salatep member is their trademark weapon, a wavy bladed dagger symbolizing the serpent Sep. In design, it would be reminiscent of the real-world Indonesian Chris Blade. We just thought a trademark weapon like this would both look distinct and unique as well as fit the serpentine theme of the guild. So as the player, you would first join this guild through one of the satellite hideouts in Hammerfell. Perhaps you came across people investigating the murder of a priest or while hearing a Salatep member preaching in the slums. You would join at this low level, do various quests such as spying and small time assassinations, but there would be a gradual build up until you prove yourself as a high ranking member. Then you'll get to the main headquarters and there is another half of the storyline which involves taking on some higher powers in the Yakutan temple, as well as even some nobles and perhaps assassinating some kings. Ultimately, being a member of the Salatep is about dismantling and disrupting the lie that his Red Guard society based around the Yakutan deities led by the tyrant Rupka, who suppressed Sep as he attempted to find another way to the walkabout. In the same way, the crowns and the forebears are like Rupka, tyrants who would wish to suppress the truth of Sep. You can see how this assassin's faction fits into the Red Guard cultural landscape as a whole, making it feel more intimately connected with the history, the culture, and mythology of the land. Plus, this storyline has some powerful potential to further explore the Akatosh Lorcan Rupka Sep dynamic. And just before we move on, I will say that this is one of the guilds that closes out another. In the case of pursuing the Salatep questline to a certain point, probably about 30% through, you would be cut off from pursuing the Yakutan Temple questline because of certain characters you would have to kill. Like we mentioned in the factions intro, sometimes we would like to have multiple factions of the same archetype, aka two mage factions or two warrior factions. So the first of our magic oriented factions is the Circle of Magi from the so-called City of Magic, Ellen here. The Circle of Magi is a somewhat exclusive group made up of various magic users from different walks of life, but united in common goal. When the Empire abandoned Hammerfell, so did the Synod Mages. And Hari was one of these Synod Mages, a local Red Guard recruit who had ascended to the rank of Master Wizard, and she personally led the Synod Hall in Ellen here. However, when the Empire abandoned Hammerfell, she did not abandon her homeland. As a pioneer in the restoration and destruction scores of magic, she put her skills to use in the war against the Old Miri Dominion. She personally saved hundreds of lives and proved invaluable to the King of Ellen here. And Hari greatly changed the perception of magic for many Red Guards, and many flocked to her so that they could learn. In the aftermath of the war, she began the Circle of Magi a faction of the greatest magical minds accessible. However, this was not merely a mages guild. The Circle of Magi had a very particular political goal. At heart, Hammerfell's interests are at the forefront, and in the wake of the war with the Old Mary Dominion, many Red Guards witnessed the devastation that magic can unleash, and in order to be better prepared and equipped to deal with such possible enemies in the future, they would have to adapt. And Hari created the Circle of Magi with the funding of the King of Ellen here. This was revolutionary, especially for a crown kingdom. She began training Hammerfell's first organized regiments of battle mages for Ellen here. Their highest ranking mages were to offer and advise the various kingdoms of Hammerfell and to maintain stability at all costs, countering the espionage attempts by the Thalmor. And Hari leads the circle and personally advises the Prince of Ellen here. His father, the King, is gravely ill by the time our game takes place, only sustained by Anhari's magic at the Prince's behest. The other members of the circle are five. Syrian, the Master Pyromancer, a Red Guard man advising the Queen of Tanith, Kosrin, the Master Illusionist, a Red Guard man advising the King of Rehard, Nerifa, the Master of Protection Magic, a Red Guard woman advising the King of Hagaith, Yanaja, the Master Scholar of Ancient Languages, a Red Guard woman advising the King of Gulane, and finally the outlier, the Breton man, Anton Guillaume, Master Enchanter advising the King of Sentinel. The only kingdoms to not accept a member of the Magi are Skaven and Dragonstar, who are both crowns. Together, including their leader and Hari, they make up the Circle of Magi. They frequently teleport back to their main apex tower in Ellen here to organize, or they use crystal balls to communicate with one another. Now remember their main goal here is to use the powers of magic to assist the kingdoms of Hammerfell, keep them united and strengthen them against the old Miri Dominion. Naturally, as a faction that was founded by someone who was once a Synod Mage, and also a Red Guard of a Crown Kingdom, necromancy is strictly forbidden. In fact, they actively root out necromancers and destroy them to make clear to the Red Guards of Hammerfell that they do not condone such actions. If you are discovered using necromancy by the circle, you will be cast out and hunted. Conjuration itself is not practiced by any of the circle nor their subordinates, however, it is not strictly forbidden. 
So it is probably a good idea to elaborate a bit on the actual structure of the Circle of Magi. Of course, you have the six masters that make up the circle at the top, but each of the masters take on various understudies. At any one time, a master has two to four apprentices, and the apprentices themselves are given specific duties, such as training Ellen here's battle mages or other such tasks. As the player, you would become Anhari's newest apprentice after proving yourself, and you would experience an entire questline learning all about magic, thwarting the Thalmor's espionage, getting involved in the metaphysical, magical machinations going on behind the scenes. Eventually, about two-thirds of the way through the questline, you would be invited to join the Circle of Magi properly, becoming the seventh member, and you would successfully prove to the Queen of Skaven that having you as an advisor would be well worth it. In the Skaven Palace, you would eventually unlock your own private tower, with a library with all kinds of magical apparatus, including a teleportation pad that can be used to instantly teleport to the tower in Ellen here, or a crystal ball which can be used to talk to any of the magi across vast distances. The last little bit I would like to mention about this faction is the aesthetic. You can kind of already gather some of the vibes, big private Arabian style towers in different cities with Eastern styled wizards, extravagant turbans, robes and wraps as they talk with crystal balls, surrounded by various lamps with incense burning at all times. Maybe it would even be cool to have some of the magi floating on a Persian style rug, Aladdin style as you speak to them, but we would want all the different members of the circle to be standout and distinct, not shying away from individual dress and flamboyance. Imagine some Ottoman Sultan style turbans with feathers and then pointed shoes. Maybe one has a pet peacock or a cobra in a basket or maybe they have strangely long nails or interestingly jeweled facial hair. Stuff like that. I feel like magic should enable eccentricities. We don't want them to just look like monks in brown robes with hoods or something like that. Now that we have discussed the first of the magical factions, it's time to discuss the next. This time it's time for the occult in the dark arts, the secret cult called Red Scuttle. At the turn of the fourth era, before Red Mountain, a young Dunman man named Sulan Dress learnt from a slowed necromancer who was at the time buying slaves from him. For a price, the slowed began teaching him the dark arts so that his Argonian slaves could be reused in death, a merely economic decision. But over time, Sulan gained a taste for necromancy. He began experimenting more with the dead, even that of the Dunma, a great taboo for which he was eventually found out. Sulan Dress was brought before a court of house dress and was sentenced to death. But before his execution could be arranged, he was ironically saved by the Argonian invasion of Morrowind in the fifth year. In the chaos, he escaped into Cyrodiil, first stopping at Chaden Hall. For a time, he joined the newly formed College of Whispers, an organization that treated no magic as taboo, employing conjuration, necromancy, and they even communed with Daedra. Sulan, over the course of his 50 years with them, actually became quite a high-ranking member, but it all changed when he managed to communicate with the Daedric Prince Namira personally. He sought out her shrine in Bruma County and found it defiled and her cult non-existent. In the years since the Oblivion Crisis, many Daedric shrines had been abandoned or destroyed. With a few apprentices and new acolytes seeking the darker mysteries, Sulan rebuilt the cult, naming it Red Scuttle, and officially split from the College of Whispers operating quietly, visiting graveyards, hiding out in caverns and tombs, refining the arts of necromancy and disease. Sulan and his acolytes eventually delved deeper into Namira's realm, engaging in cannibalism and vile primordial rituals. Sulan grew older and more powerful over the years, and Red Scuttle survived through secrecy, seeking new recruits in those accused of crimes against nature. They eventually moved to Hammerfell, a land of many tombs and preserved dead, a place where they could continue their work. Today, Red Scuttle Scuttle still operates in secret, seeking out members who pursue an interest in necromancy or Daedra, Namira in particular. A few beggars are in fact Red Scuttle members in disguise, and this is how you may come about joining the faction, eventually working your way up through the ranks, becoming Sul and Dress's right hand man at the top. Or you could be head of the faction if you choose, but that involves killing and ritualistically consuming Sulan's corpse for Namira's favour. Red Scuttle will be a faction that has many colourful but vile characters where you can learn many spells of necromancy and conjuration, unique summons and the like. It's also a path that allows you to engage in cannibalism and gain access to some powerful artifacts. The main Red Scuttle lair is protected by raised mummies and undead beetles. Just keep in mind this is ultimately a cult of Namira, Daedric Prince of Ancient Darkness, Lady of Decay. We would like it to be possible to join both magical factions, to be a member of the Circle of Magi but also a secret 
secret member of Red Scuttle, but to pull this off, perhaps you were forced to make some decisions involving the gruesome deaths of some members of the Circle of Magi performed in secret. A natural enemy of this faction would be the Adric God Arche, or Tuaka, and in the realm of the Mortal Plane, the Red Guard faction, called the Ashabar, directly opposed them, and will be the main antagonist faction of the Red Scuttle questline. The Ashabar are a Red Guard tribe that slay and purify the risen dead, a job that most Red Guards see as blasphemous and unclean, but the Ashabar see their duty as necessary so that their honored ancestors may be returned to rest. So for the Warrior Guilds, we came up with something a little bit different. You see, we didn't want a Fighters Guild 2.0, and we wanted something with a distinct Hammerfell flavor, but the problem became that the distinct flavor was of course a Sword Singer Revivalist type faction. But the problem here is that this becomes limiting because you become a sword focused warrior guild, which leaves out combat archers, claymore swingers, axe and mace users, and so on. So, we kept the sword singer inspired faction, but if you look into Hammerfell's lore, it turns out that most of the time they don't maintain a standing army, and they have many knightly orders, which to us indicated that the ideal Elder Scrolls 6 Hammerfell should have a few of those. So, ultimately, what we would propose is to have multiple warrior guilds or knightly orders that are shorter but more specific in terms of playstyle and feel. Then again, if it is our ideal, ideally they would all be nice and just as long, but we're trying to make it realistically achievable, so either way, this is what we came up with, the three warrior-oriented guilds. And also I do want to throw out there that you should be able to join all of them, giving you a big warrior experience if you desire, but some do have consequences. The Sword Singers, the Knights of the Scarab, and the Order of Diagna are the three. Let's first talk about the latter. The Order of Diagna is one of the most famous knightly orders in all of Hammerfell. It was once led by the most legendary warrior of all time, Gaiden Shinji, who fought in the first Siege of Orsinium. In fact, they annually recreate the Siege of Orsinium ceremoniously, where the initiates to the Order play the part of the Orcs. Before we get into where they are and how to join them, let's first talk about their namesake. Diagna is the Orichalc god. He was an avatar of Hunding, the Makeway god of the Red Guards. However, Diagna was so vital to the Yakutan fight against the left handed elves that he achieved permanence in their pantheon of gods. In fact, it was he who brought them weapons of Orichalcum, giving the Yakutans an edge over the elves. So, when fitting with the theme, we thought that this Order of Diagna should use only weapons made of Orichalcum, and they have preserved special forging techniques swords, maces, spears, axes, arrows, all types of weapons are used, but they are made of orichalcum. Now, a big part of the Order of Diagna is their history with the Orcs and Orsinium, a history that in the Fourth Era is bound to repeat itself, as Orsinium has been built once again, but on the cusp of Hammerfell's very own territory, just to the east of Dragonstar. The Order of Diagna in the Fourth Era have their estate at the foot of the Dragon Tail Mountains, on the northern side, west of Dragonstar. They venture into High Rock often at the service of Wayrest, but also they have served for Sentinel, Dragonstar, and at times Skaven. However, as of late, with a growing Orsinium, they have been working closely with the King of Dragonstar, protecting the lands from Orcish raids. The questline would start by meeting with a member in Dragonstar, and there would be an initiation and various ranks and quests before it would ultimately culminate in an actual siege of Orsinium, as the Order teams up with the forces of Dragonstar. This would obviously close out your ability to join up with the Orcs if you sack the entire city, but on the other hand, you can join up with the Orcs of Orsinium as an Orc or as a friend of the city and defend it from the Order of Diagna and Dragonstar, which of course means you cannot join them. But if you don't care about the Orcs and you want to be a Knight of Diagna, you will be rewarded with many awesome Orichalcum weapons, including rare and unique forging techniques for Orichalcum gear. Next up, we have the Order of the Scarab, a knightly order that once had the privilege of protecting the royal Tutambu family, but due to political machinations throughout the Third and Early Fourth Eras, that has changed. After a series of failures, they spent many decades in shame, honing their skills privately, developing new techniques, improving themselves so that they will never fail again. During the Great War, they proved themselves invaluable. The once shamed Order of the Scarab came into battle in unconventional fashion. Unlike most Red Guard warriors, they were shelled in suits of heavy metal armor, enchanted with fire heat resistance to curb the usual issues of such armor in arid hot regions such as Hammerfell. They rode in on purebred Yakutan charges with lances in hand, as well as ornate 
ornate shields mimicking the scarab beetle of their namesake. Lighter armoured horse archers assisted them. They were critical in the retaking of Tanith from the Aldmeri Dominion and earned themselves wide renown. The Queen of Tanith honoured them all and provided them an estate just outside the city. The knights are cavalry specialists, whether that be heavily armoured chargers or horse-mounted archers. On their estate, they continue to breed pure Yakutan chargers and they often perform tourneys with lances for practice and for the entertainment of Tanith's people. Joining up with this order would be done by seeking them out at their estate, and their quests would often be related to dealing with threats to Tanith, and most quests would involve mounted combat. You would be able to eventually become a full-fledged high-ranking member with a pristine heavy set of their signature armor, along with a Yakutan charger of your own, the fastest and hardiest horse available. And finally, we have come to the Sword Singers, the one you are all keen for. Now, we came up with a little bit of an unconventional one for this. As far as the lore is concerned, the whole Ansai Sword Saints with their Shihai swords is a long lost art. However, the ways of friend are hunting are preserved in the Book of Circles. But listen up, our story begins with a young surviving member of the Blades in the aftermath of the Great War. His name was Caius Aurelian, a Cyrodiilic native. He, however, he could not abide the capitulation of the Empire to the Thalmor. He helped the Redguard forces continue to fight against the Aldmeri Dominion, and years later they prevailed with the Second Treaty of Stros Makai. He was already a brilliant swordsman with the blade signature Akaviri Katana, but while in Hammerfell, he learnt to fight with a scimitar and improved his swordsmanship amongst the greatest of Hammerfell. He began studying the Book of Circles and roamed the land, seeking masters to teach him new techniques. After 10 years of roaming Hammerfell, year 190 of the Fourth Era, Caius devised the creation of a new sword, one that would create a synthesis of both blades, the katana and the curved scimitar. A balanced blade that would facilitate both the Akaviri and Redguard techniques, he ended up creating his signature sword which would resemble this kind of blade, a, a kind of Turco-Mongol saber, a blend of real-world West and East Asian. He perfected a new and unique style of martial art with this new style of blade. He continued his adventures, trialing and testing his skill, but one day he came across a tomb, within it an ancient corpse, holding an ancient stone. Upon touching the stone, his mind was awash with a flood of memories belonging to an ancient sword singer, a member of the Regatta. These memories led him to two more memory stones of other ancient Regatta members, and this is what began his path to revive the sword singers. He recruits other Red Guards and Valiant Warriors of all races to join him on this quest to revive the sword singers. He finds part of an ancient tome belonging to a great red guard warrior named Sai Sahan, who himself was a member of the Dragon Guard and attempted to revive the sword singers, but failed. Caius picked up where he left off. He uncovered the deserted Windscour Temple and used this as a hidden base to begin rebuilding the Order. By the time of our game, the Order would have been functioning for over 10 years, an order of warriors led by an aging Caius Aurelian. These warriors have adopted the new style of blade, as well as the synthesis of the Akaviri and Redguard martial styles, all of them exclusively using the sword to seek mastery. Aesthetically, they are Yakutan and Redguard inspired, with more of an Akaviri influence with some of that Akaviri style armor and clothing. And if you watched our IRL inspirations for the Elder Scrolls video, you would know that the Yakutans and by extension the Red Guards are heavily inspired by Japan and the Samurai, despite the aesthetic appearance of the North African and Middle Eastern cultures. Check out that video for more explanation, but I think this combination of Akaviri and Yakutan into a single faction doubles down on the Sword Singer's core influence of the Samurai, and it makes for a really cool faction. So when you discover this faction and join up with them, if you want to, you will be doing various quest types but a core running theme is the revival of the sword singer, specifically the art of manifesting the Shihai, the spirit sword. This would involve hunting down memory stones and going through ancient tombs, talking to ghosts, all kinds of stuff. Now, while we think it would be too overpowered to be able to achieve ancient sword singer level proficiency, we think it could still work in a way that when you complete the guild quest line, you are actually able to manifest a Shihai and complete Caius's dream and the dream of Sai Sahan before him. However, compared to the sword singers of old, you would be a rookie. We think it should be a once a day power that when used summons a Shihai in your hand, a sword made from your very own soul that cannot be blocked, but only lasts for 30 seconds. This way, it seems somewhat realistic without completely shattering the lore. We didn't want some bleach level Bankai super anime sword focus for the game, but I think this still satisfies the sword singer feeling.
Now for probably one of the only returning joinable factions, the Thieves Guild. But then again, every Thieves Guild, while they share the same name, seem to be quite individual and autonomous organizations across each province without a singular continent-wide central figurehead. In Oblivion, we had the whole Grey Fox thing, and in Skyrim, we had the whole Nightingale skeleton key thing, both of which added some really cool flavor to a band of thieves. And we would like to do something new and unique, but once again relating to Nocturnal, the patron of thieves, though she does not have to be the focus. We also don't want another rebuild the thieves guild kind of thing like the whole it's in disrepair vibe also elder scrolls online had a thieves guild storyline and introduced a new city called abba's landing a free merchant city situated on hughes bane i think it would be a great place to return to and the city itself would add some diversity to hammerfell as it would have a bit of a hive of scum and villainy vibe to it instead of being a kingdom ruled by a king so this would be a great place for a thieves guild plenty of trade and merchant activity a bit more freedom as the real real ruler here is money rather than a king, even though there's still a leader of sorts, and it could have some really awesome pirate vibes. Hammerfell's coasts are known for corsairs and pirates after all, so I think this would be where you join up with the guild, but perhaps there are also satellite hideouts or fences or members in other cities. We would love for the Thieves Guild to have that interconnected feel once again, with beggars as eyes and ears everywhere, and of course we need to have some cool heists, and with all the kingdoms around there are bound to be opportunities. We would also really like the Thieves Guild once you are higher rank or the leader to be able to be influenced into a more mafia style criminal organization or a bit more of a Robin Hood type scenario. The choice would be yours through your actions. We were thinking that for the storyline it could actually involve an interplay of Nocturnal and Clavicus Vile. Clavicus Vile being the Daedric Prince of Pax. Perhaps the Guildmaster made a bad deal with Clavicus Vile and maybe it could even involve some unexpected magical stuff in the finale such as a heist with the aid of Nocturnal where you sneak in into his Daedric realm and steal back an artifact of Nocturnal or something like that. It would just be a great way to cap off a quest line full of crime and heists, and you could truly call yourself the ultimate thief when you steal from a Daedric prince. But now let's talk about religion. In our ideal Elder Scrolls 6 set in Hammerfell, we would like you to be able to join various religious factions like you could in Morrowind with the Tribunal Temple and the Imperial Cult. We think this is near essential for roleplaying a crusader, a priest, a monk, a paladin, any kind of religious oriented character. Having a faction you can join involved around piety and zealous fervor is a great move in our opinion, and we have two that we would like to include, starting first with the Yakutan Temple of the Crowns. Let's first explain their faith. The eight primary gods of the crowns are Satakal, the world skin, the giant serpent of cycles, a sort of fusion between the concepts of Anu and Padme. There is Rupta, or Tall Papa as he is often called, who is the rough equivalent of Akutosh or Oriel, and he discovered the walkabout, the method by which the spirits can survive Satakal's cycles. There is Tawaka, the god of the afterlife, the caretaker of the far shores. There is Zet, the god of agriculture. Morwa, the god of fertility, portrayed with four arms so she can grab more husbands. There is Tava, the Yakutan spirit of air, a favorite of sailors. Then there is Onsi, the war god who taught mankind to pull their knives into swords. And finally, there is Diagna, the avatar of Hoon Ding that was so great that he achieved permanence in the Pantheon. Diagna brought Orichalc weapons to the Yakutans. So recap, so the eight of the crowns are Sadakal, Ruptga, Tuwaka, Zet, Morwa, Tava, Onsi, and Diagna. The main temple of the faith, where its leadership resides, is in Hagaith, but there are also high priests that run the temples in Dragonstar, Skaven, and Ellen here, as well as priests that run smaller temples and shrines in towns and even in Forebear cities. The Yakutan temple would be joinable, but it would close you out of the Eight Divines temple and vice versa. Both questlines would involve some religious friction that would prove consequential for the other. As for the other temple options, we have the Eight Divines, the Forebear's faith, which is essentially the imperial cult with a few Yakutan names. Names. The eight they worship are the divines you would be the most familiar with. Akatosh, Tava, aka Kinnereth, Julianos, Dabella, Tawaka, aka RK, Zet, aka Zenithar, Morwa, aka Mara, and Stendar. For the forebears, the Yakutan and Imperial names for the divines are often interchangeable, whereas the Yakutan temple believes that they are different. Joining this faction would include ranks like the Imperial cult in Morrowind, leading all the way to the highest rank of primate. Their main temple is in Rehad, and their other temples are in Sentinel, Galane, and Tanith, as well as smaller temples and shrines in smaller towns. Generally, 
generally, though, the crowns tend to get rid of forebear shrines or temples in their territory. Overall, the religious factions are rather straightforward, and a lot of their missions would involve religious-oriented goals, charity, heretic hunting, fighting Daedra worshippers, healing quests for enlightenment, ancient scriptures, that kind of stuff. The other minor faction relating to religion in Hammerfell is the Talos Cult. We envision this as a minor joinable faction with a small series of quests, kind of like the Bard's College. You see, because of the White Gold Concordat, Talos worship was outlawed within the Empire. If you continued to worship Talos, you may be legally taken by the Thalmor and tortured and or killed. However, Hammerfell is not part of the Empire anymore and has become somewhat of a haven for Talos worshippers because they can worship freely here without persecution. Mind you, many Red Guards have a problem with people worshipping an Emperor and God of the Traitorous Empire, but it is still nothing compared to the persecution of the Thalmor and Empire lands. You will find Talos worshippers scattered throughout Hammerfell, but particularly in Rehad you will find a small imperial style temple dedicated to Talos, maintained by a cult to Talos. The priest here is an imperial veteran of the Great War, born in Anvil, and after the Empire betrayed their god, he came across the border to Rehad with his Redguard wife and built a temple with his sons. Since then, more have joined the Temple of Talos. Alright ladies and gentlemen, time to talk about the last three factions, all of which are vampire clans, three clans that have risen to dominance in Hammerfell over the rest. Each clan has a distinct archetype and bonuses. First, the Kulari clan. The Kulari clan of vampires are known for their unique paralysis abilities, known to hide in the sands of the night and emerge like a spider grabbing their prey. We thought it was fitting to have this bloodline offer benefits to stealth abilities and skills. The Selenu clan is named for its ancient progenitor, the Nedic tribal woman who issued the cremation of Lame Balefag. Selenu are noted for their elemental resistances, and we thought it would be fitting to have this bloodline grant bonuses for the warrior archetype, enhancing the character with supernatural speed in combat. And finally, there is the Anthotus clan, a bloodline gifted with great intellect, and naturally, it would make sense to offer more magical-oriented bonuses for vampires of this clan. So each of the clans inhabit an archetype that comes with different bonuses and unique powers. Kalari clan is stealth, Selenu clan is combat, and Anthotus clan is magic. Now these clans are spread throughout Hammerfell and also make up a generic enemy type. If you get infected in combat or bitten by any of these vampires, you will contract the disease, and in three days it will evolve into full vampirism. Upon becoming a vampire of this bloodline, you receive a message that indicates you have a magical calling. This points you to the direction of your respective clan, and you discover the hideout of the clan leaders respectively. Whichever clan you become a part of, the other two vampire clans will remain hostile, but your clan now becomes friendly, including what are usually enemy NPCs of that clan. Each clan leader offers a small quest line, and there is a merchant that will sell spells and all kinds of vampire related gear and there are people that can teach you about your skills and help you enhance your abilities remember this is hammerfell land of the hot sun and as a vampire you will be receiving constant sun damage of varying degrees depending on your stage of vampirism as well as debuffs to your attributes also at stage 4 you will be attacked on site However, there are workarounds for both of these problems. Fully enclosing your face with a helmet or mask will prevent stage 4 attacks on sight. Wearing full closed armor, hoods, robes, or certain special enchanted jewelry that you can buy from the clan will allow you to negate the sun damage. Shade and overcast or rainy weather will also prevent the sun's damage. However, no matter what you do, you will always have the attribute debuffs during the day. Undoubtedly, after talking about vampire clans, we are going to get asked about were creatures. Now, for our ideal Elder Scrolls 6 Hammerfell, we don't actually have a faction or guild for were creatures. There would be an additional quest for Hercene if you contract lycanthropy, but there is no faction as such. You would also have unique dialogue with some other secret lycanthropes, and you'll be able to encounter a character called Cormac, a reachman now living in the Dragon Tail Mountains by himself, with a small shrine to Hercene. He is a werebore, and if you have lycanthropy, he can tell, and he will offer to sell you various unique rings or lycanthrope-related items. And yes, you heard that right, in our Hammerfell game, you would be able to become a werewolf or a werebore, both of which come with different perk trees, advantages, and disadvantages. But that, ladies and gentlemen, wraps up factions 
for our ideal Elder Scrolls 6 Hammerfell. Now let's look at some maps of Hammerfell and go through each area to give you a better feel for what the game world is like. We'll be showing official maps, fan maps, the map from Arena and other Elder Scrolls maps and our game won't precisely be the same as any of them but sort of draws inspiration from all of them. It's a bit of an amalgamation. There are eight main kingdoms in the game, each with their own atmospheres, factions, leaders, politics and surrounding environments. Keep in mind that we can't mention every single location, so there'll be plenty of infested caves, bandit lairs, and other enemy-filled places around. Plenty of Daedric Shrines, too. In our ideal Hammerfell, and also in the lore, it seems to fit best that there are four Forebear Kingdoms and four Crowns Kingdoms. The Forebears, while distinctly Redguard in culture, are certainly more progressive and the Crowns more traditional. Throughout history, there has been much division and conflict between these two major political parties, although, after assisting one another in fending off the Thalmor invasion, they found peace, with the Second Treaty of Stross Mackay being signed in the 180th year of the Fourth Era. The Dominion withdrew its military forces from Hammerfell and the Red Guard province became independent, no longer under control of the Empire, who they consider weak for essentially surrendering to the Dominion's terms. The might of Hammerfell was diminished after sustaining much damage in the conflict with the Thalmor and with the Empire no longer directing them, each main city has become much more independent. While there has been a High King before, there is currently no central authority or single leader who exerts control over the province. There is also no leader of the Crowns or leader of the Forebears. Some kingdoms may exert strong influence over others simply by being more powerful and more needed by others, but officially speaking, all kingdoms have autonomy over themselves, and there's a loose expectation that in times of need, forebears will always be there to help forebears, and crowns will always be there to help crowns. They are bound together by a cultural overtone and a mostly shared vision for the Red Guard people. That said, all the cities will be run by leaders who still have differing opinions and beliefs than kingdoms of the same political alignment. With our game set not too long after Skyrim, the Crowns and Forebears have been at peace for over 20 years. This is not to say they love one another or agree wholeheartedly with each other, but simply that they are not currently fighting with one another. There are no civil wars and no immediate threats of conflict, however, as you'd expect, tensions between kingdoms still exist and could escalate depending on certain decisions you make. Let's start off by talking about Sentinel. Considered the capital of the province, Sentinel is known as a great city of the Red Guards, and we'd want it to look like exactly that. Think big, massive towers, the biggest city in the entire game. With a dock operating right on the waters of the Iliac base, Sentinel is a huge hub of trade with High Rock, full of unique characters, plenty of merchants, and lots of opportunity, especially for those with the stomach for it. Pirate smugglers could be found around the docks, giving you the opportunity to join them in making some profits. Some will have lots of work for you, keeping you coming back with so much coin that any guilt you feel from helping them is completely destroyed, while others may feel very distrusting to be around. Maybe they'll even betray you and try to steal your share of the cut. But not everyone around the dock has bad intentions. Most are still honest working people, always looking for a helping hand to send on an adventure. Side quests from Sentinel could really take you anywhere in the province, and this excitement of not knowing what adventure could be next will have you interacting with as many NPCs as you can, which by extension will expose you to more lore about this grand city, the Red Guard people, the recent history since the Second Treaty of Stross Mackay, and the rest of the province in general. Stretching up from the water and the docks, you will find many smaller markets decorating the path into the main city area. Various stalls selling jewelry and crafting supplies, perhaps a vendor willing to help you change the color of certain clothing pieces like robes, hoods, or capes. We want Sentinel to feel grand, and to achieve this we thought it would be great to really emphasize the verticality and the density of the city, much more than what was seen in Elder Scrolls online, so when you see the city in the distance, it's breathtaking. Think of something of similar scale to Novigrad in Witcher 3. Coming into the city from the bottom, you'd be taking a step through the gates and the giant fortified city walls and into the lower districts. Coming through this entrance, you'll see the poorer parts of Redguard society, but it's not bad enough here to be called poverty. Sentinel is still a rich city, and even the poorest of inhabitants still have a basic standard of living. We'd want more districts to build up from here, with the city structures building further further and further uphill through richer districts until you reach the top, home to the palace and various giant Arabian-inspired towers that stretch into the sky, rounded at the top and covered in gold. In some aspects, you could look at the way King's Landing from Game of Thrones is built to better envision the theme of verticality in a sprawling city. Walking through the districts, you're going to be treated to various types of ancient Red Guard architecture, bustling bazaars which are Middle Eastern star markets, and of course, places of religious significance. While each district may have these 
these aforementioned markets off to the side, the main street which cuts through almost all the districts will still be littered with various stalls and shop vendors. It would technically be the furthest stretching market in any Elder Scrolls game so far. The palace here is known as Samarik, which was built long ago, standing as the oldest piece of Redguard architecture. Another thing to note would be the presence of a royal theatre. Attendance here would be an exotic treat for various members of nobility from Hyrock, who would come to enjoy the bizarre morality plays and the unique native cooking and craftsmanship. Outside the city there will be a few pockets of greenery, but generally speaking everything is very dry. Not too far of Sentinel you will be able to visit an established village known as Chase Town, where you may wish to stop in for the night or shop at the general goods store. The owner is lucky enough to have scavenged some rare trinkets from the desert, which his wife thinks was absolutely crazy to attempt even though he succeeded. The border of the Alakir Desert is found nearby to the southeast of Sentinel, and this massive expanse will be home to all of the different tribes of Alakir nomads we talked about in the faction section, as well as the various ruins of old civilizations, particularly Yakudin and Dwema. Besides ruins and nomad camps, there will also be abandoned mines and caves to explore. As you journey through this desert, you will quickly realize just how extreme and inhospitable the conditions are. The nomads are well equipped to thrive here, and unfortunately for you, so are various desert creatures who may wish you harm. Assassin beetles, giant scorpions, a massive black and red snake coiled up in a cave. You get the idea. But not everything is out to get you. You may see a thorn gecko scurry about here and there, camels drinking at each oasis, sometimes with passive nomads riding them, and even some owls come nighttime. In the southeast of the Alakir, you'll be able to find the ruins of Hunding's Watch, in which Windscour Temple is hidden beneath, along with our previously discussed sword singer inspired faction. But heading out of the north part of the desert, you'll find the terrain gets rockier and more mountainous, and there's actually a town known as Volnum's Gate here, which we would think would be perfect if it was actually built into the side of the mountains on the outskirts of a Dwemer ruin entrance, which only the Count of the Town has access to. If you do enough side quests for the town, the Count will allow you to enter deep into the ruins, with the promise that if you can wipe out the dead dangers within to allow the town to expand deep inside and use the ruins for strategic reasons, you can keep whatever treasure you find on your way. A path through the mountains here heading further north will send you to Laneland, as will the path leading up from Sentinel directly. This small city is more or less under the control of Sentinel, although it was once a crown city which will be reflected in the architecture and temple motifs. Up from the sandy docks, where plenty of ships are resting on the water, you'll find that the environment is quite forested and green. Even the exterior of the modest city palace will be overrun with vines and leaves on the outside walls and on the tiles at the top of the tower peaks. The ruler here has no desire to have these vines removed, however, as they keep her feeling closer to nature and the source of all life. She's a very spiritual leader. The forest biome comes into full force northeast of Laneland, where there will be a pocket of lush greenery, with rivers running through and stretching out in various directions. Expect to find the odd red guard bandit camp here, creatures such as wolves, giant wasps, and harpies. In fact, harpies are quite the nuisance around Laneland, as long ago, many Daedra worshippers from the city were said to be turned into harpies for their blasphemy. You'll also find a very exquisite alien ruin from long ago named Sir Tassel. Currently, this ruin is used as a base for a group of high elf bandit mages and their merciless leader, who find it very advantageous to use conjuration magic. They might raise the dead when you fight them, but for the most part they are definitely more like summoners than necromancers. Moving down the province south of Sentinel, we arrive at the crown city of Hagaith, a city which would have been completely sieged by the Thalmor if the forebears of Sentinel didn't send forces to help fight them off. It was this event that created an alliance between both the forebears and the crowns, which lasts to the time our ideal game is set. Interestingly, Hagaith was once the capital of Hammerfell before the capital was moved to Sentinel, and it was the first place the Yakudans landed when they first sailed to Tamriel from their original continent. It's a place of deep traditional Yukunan roots, said to be an impregnable defense with austere ramparts of antique splendor built upon the ruins of previous civilizations. We think it would be the coolest if these ruins were actually Dwemer, and are actually discoverable if you go down deep enough into the dungeons of the palace. On the surface, the city will look very old and fortressy. You'll have a marketplace and clusters of two-story adobe-style housing inside the city walls. We can imagine these structures and fortifications of this city looking ancient, protective, worn, but sturdy like the walls of an old Moroccan castle. Certain parts of the fortifications, however, may look more modern, rebuilt with fresh materials since the Thalmor came through and caused lots of damage. 
It would be a large city, but obviously not as large as Sentinel. By the water's edge, you'll find ships docked that sail between there and Stross Mackay. You'll meet some Stross Mackay pirate types here also, who will have side quest options that encourage you to visit this nearby famous Redguard Island. The temple in Hagaith will function as the head of the Yakutan Temple faction, and it's no surprise that it will be absolutely massive. Inside would feature grand shrines to all of the Yakutan pantheon, of which the crown's leadership and citizenry tend to be very proud of. That said, one of the most iconic landmarks of the city is actually a place of veneration for both the crowns and the forebears. This is the Shrine of Tava, the Yakutan spirit of air and sun, known for leading the Yakutans to the Isle of Hearn after their continent was destroyed. At this shrine, there is a mural depicting Tava in her nest with two mates, symbolizing the union of forebears and crowns factions. By the time our game takes place, Hagaith is the kind of place that would be very interesting to explore from a political perspective, because we can imagine them originally being one of the staunchest crown cities in terms of sticking to tradition. However, after being saved by the forebears, you would have plenty of red guards who were once young children or teenagers who have grown up knowing the forebears that saved them, ushering in more acceptance and sympathy towards the forebears than ever before. This could perhaps lead to some conflict between older, traditional folk and some younger members of society who are trying to introduce tolerance towards the practice of the forebears pantheon. There could also be certain quests here for the king where your choices may change the culture in the city slightly depending on who you help. It's also worth mentioning that we'd like to implement a sailboat system into Elder Scrolls 6 if the game was set in Hammerfell. Now, we don't mean anything like Assassin's Creed Black Flag or some full pirate simulator. All we mean is something like what's available in Witcher 3 to allow you to travel between certain spots on the map more easily. It's not a huge part of the game just a little option for those wanting to travel from Hagaith to Tanith or maybe from Tanith down to Rehard, stopping off at different places along the coast or going to Hughes Bane. You could even sail to Stross Mackay, although it's a lot easier to just pay for passage and then fast travel from then on. You get the idea. Traveling around the roads leading north of Hagaith, you'll find your way between forest on one side and mountains up the other until you come to Dragon Grove. In our game, Dragon Grove will be a simple but widespread village with plenty of crops which are grown to sustain not only the village population but also to sell to Hagaith. Some buildings will spread throughout a large opening between the trees and go down to the water's edge, while others are nestled closer to the mountainside. Again, it's not an impressive village, it's just very spread out with lots of space between structures. If you head north from here, you'll cut through some rocky cliff sides and up to Sunkeep, which is quite a wealthy large town due to the gold mines in the area and also due to the payments it receives from Hagaith and even Sentinel. And why do these cities send Sunkeep this coin? Well, surprisingly, the town has one of the best fortified jails in Hammerfell, and when the jails in the cities are too full, excess criminals are carted off to Sunkeep. The conditions in the jail are a lot worse to live in and paid militia stand outside for anyone who miraculously manages to escape. And across the sea to the south of Hagaith, you'll find the infamous island of Stross Mackay, a place that is a must visit in any Elder Scrolls Hammerfell game. Here the main city is Port Hunding, and it's not a kingdom in the sense that the eight main ones are, however it's a highly significant place acting as a crown's principality run by the son of the king of Hagaith. Port Hunding would be filled with sailor types and undoubtedly would have the most pirate themes in the game, alluding back to the Red Guard Adventures game, which was set here, and there'll be references and easter eggs for longtime Elder Scrolls fans. Visually, Stross Mackay will be absolutely beautiful with tropical beach areas that are refreshing just to take a look at. You'll have coral reefs too, but plenty of sandy dunes to let you know you're still in Hammerfell. Toward the western end of the isle, you will be able to visit an area of more rugged terrain, the Ogre's Tooth Mountains. These are not only tough to traverse, but also feature the lost city-state of Dwemer known as Darzark. Expect to see plenty of assassin's beetles in the area and Durzog too, which look like spiny dark green reptilian hounds with six red eyes. Stross Mackay is also home to wolves, but that doesn't sound so bad by comparison, does it? Also remember the infamous Jaren route from Skyrim? Well, it's native to the island as well. Port Hunding will have markets, homes, and guards just like anywhere else, with an inn designed so beautifully in traditional Red Guard manner that you may at first think it's the temple. And for all the drunk sailors, I guess it may as well be. The main city area will be separated from the palace by a large ravine, with the river splitting not only the city, but the main island in two. It's also worth noting that the other islands of the coast of Hammerfell can be visited, and while they're not overly significant, they're home to little secrets of their own.
But moving back to the main landmass and then east from Hagaith, we arrive at a forebears controlled city known as Ghislaine. No Redguard city can really be called peaceful, but Ghislaine can often feel this way in our ideal game. Yes, it's been involved with various wars and conflicts in the past, but as of the game time, things are stable, and the large focus on religious acceptance and variety in the city will be immediately clear. Priests, monks, and practitioners of various faiths can be found walking amongst the streets of the city, eager to accept you into their ranks, or at least to tell you all about their religion. Multiple temples and places of worship will be found in the city, and there will be quite a number of inns too, five in total. Many of the traditional Redguard architecture styles found in Hammerfell will be used in the city here. However, Galen will specifically have a large focus on Adobe-style buildings which are painted in various colors, mainly red, giving this city quite the festive feel. Be it temples, marketplaces, people's homes where they live with their family, expect to see a lot of colors and patterns around this city, with plenty of the buildings looking blockier with flat roofs as opposed to large circular domes. Again, you will still see dome-like structures, just less than other cities of Hammerfell. With all the religious tolerance, it's no surprise that the city is part of the Forebears faction. With previous Imperial rulers, the cosmopolitan nature of things is enhanced even further. The city's king rules from a Redguard palace that looks distinctly Redguard in base design, but heavily modified to have a much more rigid Imperial look. This is especially the case with the interior architecture, and this imperial influence comes from the previous rulers of Ghislaine, one of which was Sephiroth the First, an eventual emperor who supposedly ruled the city with a red guard wife named Bianchi. There's no paint on the walls here, but of course the palace looks grand and noble, with gold and black colored structures gleaming due to the very valuable materials they're made from. In stark contrast to the rest of the city, the guards barracks and the prison will be shaped like the other buildings, but built from bland stone materials. A reminder that not everything in life Life is bright and cheerful. Do the wrong thing and you'll quickly find out. Religious and philosophical quarrels are common in Ghislaine, although most discussion is kept to a designated debate hall built in the city, of which guards are always in attendance. Like any Red Guard city, Ghislaine is home to plenty of boring old regular folk who keep the wheels spinning, so to speak. More interestingly, you'll also encounter various expeditioners who are here to study the ruins of the Dwemer Rorkin clan capital city, which are buried under the sands a bit to the north in the Alakir. One may ask for your help in solving an ancient mystery, which of course you won't be able to resist. During this quest, you'll definitely learn more about the Dwemer, uncovering some new lore secrets you never knew before. Like many other cities in Hammerfell, Ghislaine is also built near the water and has a port that facilitates trade. The city will have a healthy rivalry with Tanith, with the opposition between both cities being unlike the true rivalry they had in the Third Era and much more friendly in nature. Both cities come under the Forebears faction, and with Tanith also having a port on the water to the east, they'll both be competing for trade. To the northeast of Ghislaine, there's a town known as Laneben Place. It's quite large, with a few streets of houses, two inns, a temple, a marketplace, and even a small palace of which the leader of the town lives. It's not a main city, and the leader here doesn't really have much power, but it still aims to function as a kind of independent town, trading with Ghislaine and Tanith. The guards of the place look much more like mercenaries wearing different sets of armor, the only thing uniting them being an affixed insignia to represent the town. A few statues of various red guard warriors can be found on the streets, and similarly to Ghislaine, you'll see some of the same painted adobe-style buildings here also, with more yellows and blues than reds. Then west of here, more or less directly north of Ghislaine, you'll have Shady Grove, a village that used to be called Shady March in Arena, but was later renamed to Shady Grove in the Red Guard map of Tamriel, in reference to a highway near the Rockville Bethesda offices. It even features in Elder Scrolls Blades. The region here is much greener than other parts of Hammerfell. There will be plenty of forest vibes with sky-reaching trees and wooden buildings making up most of the living dwellings. There will be an inn here where you can rest, and if you don't like that, too bad. There's only the one bedroom available. I imagine a cool quest from here could be investigating someone's child who went missing in the grove, only to discover they've been led astray by the voices of a Daedric Prince. It would be really unexpected for an otherwise insignificant location, and could make the place quite creepy, as I imagine the Daedra would have sin sinister intentions. Perhaps you're asked to inflict serious trauma on the village, lying to the parents and assisting in creating some 
eerie occurrences. There's also a large river nearby, and if you head up this river or just follow the path leading north from Laneburn Place, you'll travel past some independent farms, some grasslands, and eventually find a village called Riverview. And no, I'm not talking about a big, beautiful house in Chadenhall. This Redguard village is going to be constructed near the ruins of an old Yakudin settlement, of which now only statues to the gods and crumbled buildings remain. Residents of Riverview can be found praying here, and that's about it for this village. There's a good view down the river length too if you're standing in the right spot. Heading northeast from here, there's a large expanse of tropical forest, with plenty of water streams and rivers throughout. Here you will find giant snakes, forest scorpions, and even some abandoned graveyards haunted by wraiths and skeletons. Eventually you'll hit the mountain ranges and a location known as Thorstad Place. Thorstad Place is on flat ground in the middle of the mountains, surrounded pretty much on all sides. It was once a Red Guard village, although during the Empire's reign in Hammerfell, we've come up with the idea that an Imperial fortress was built here to station troops, diplomats, and other important nobles as they traveled between main cities. When the Empire withdrew from Hammerfell and the province became independent, a group of opportunistic marauders swarmed the location en masse, taking it over before any official Hammerfell kingdom could. Anyways, if we go back to Galen and head south, you'll see there's a huge landmass stretching out into the water, a barren region with a peninsula known as Hughes Bane. It's quite the rocky landscape, but the most notable part of this area is Abba's Landing, and there's a quote from the Elder Scrolls Online which I can't help but use to describe it. Abba's Landing, the jewel of Kefram, if you hid the jewel up a camel's ass to smuggle it past the Dockmaster. Abba's Landing is believed to be a city where the Thieves Guild originated from. It is a highly busy port city with plenty of trade and loads of smuggling. It will be known as a free merchant city. Less rules, less red tape, just a general low tax paid to the leader of the city on any goods sold. No illegal items are allowed though, at least officially speaking. Here you will still find many merchants who are abiding by the law and simply trade here as it's more profitable. However, you'll also be able to find secret underground black markets with the option to buy rare and illegal goods from all over Tamriel. Poisons harvested from the swamps of Black Marsh, an enchanted necklace stolen from the current Imperial Battle Mage's quarters in Cyrodiil, you name it, there will be plenty of unique and interesting things to buy here if you know the right people and have the right amount of coin. The the boat system I spoke about earlier could actually be used here as part of a quest, where you sail in some smuggled goods you had to steal from the city to the east, Rehad. As of recent times, as in when our game is set, degeneracy has been on the rise in Abba's Landing. As mentioned in the Factions section, you'll be able to join up with the Thieves Guild here, gaining access to their headquarters. Moving east from Galane, we arrive at another Forebears port city known as Tanith. You'll notice that the Forebears control all of the port cities except for Higaith and Strasmachai too, I suppose, meaning that they have an advantage over many other crown cities when it comes to profitable trade with outsiders. Tanith is running smoothly by the time our game takes place, but if you remember the dialogue from the Skyrim quest in Time of My Need, Tanith fell after it was supposedly betrayed from within. Due to this, we'd want to give the city plenty of ruined areas, so as far as our aesthetics goes, it's still somewhat of a typical Red Guard city, and yes, richer districts do exist, but what's unique is that the poorer areas will truly look and feel like slums, places without the resources or incentive to be rebuilt completely by our ideal game setting. The richer areas were prioritized by the Queen, and the poorer areas left to fend for themselves. As a result, you will see more beggars here, and quite a disdain for the rich and noble class from many of the lower classes, especially those doing it tough. Perhaps you'll find out the truth is that the kingdom really hasn't mustered the coin to rebuild everything entirely, but even in spite of this, you'll sympathize with those who have since been displaced by the crisis, who would argue that even if the funds were allocated to the richer districts first, it could have been fairer for them to spend less on repairing golden fancy structures and more the bare basics for those who still need them. Perhaps you'll be able to question the Queen on this, who will argue that rebuilding the more significant, prestigious areas of the city is not wasteful, as they bring an immense, although intangible, cultural value, which she says energizes the spirits of all who view its glory, and keeps Tanith as more than just a bustling dock on the map. We'd want there to be convincing or at least sympathetic arguments on both sides of the conflict between the various wealth classes of the city. Another interesting thing about Tanith will be the Lady Cinnabar Library, named after the famed author from Tanith who has written many law-based texts. In this library you'll find works from authors all over Hammerfell, High Rock, Cyrodiil and beyond, which you'll be able to read to learn more about Tamriel. You'll also be able to go on quests for the librarian too, although it may not be as simple as recovering lost books like in Skyrim. Instead, perhaps the librarian has 
has found texts with law contradictions and actually sends you to a location, perhaps an ancient Aelid ruin, which do exist in Hammerfell, to delve deep inside, defeat the dangers and uncover the truth. Maybe one book is proved correct and so the other is deemed fiction in the library, or maybe both books are partially right in their own way, even though they seem to be saying different things to begin with. Tanith is also home to the Tower of the Fifth Doctrine, which is where Lady Cinnabar wrote from. We don't know what it looks like, although in one of her texts, she hinted that it is somewhat humble, at least compared to other important towers in Tamriel. We'd have the design inspired partly by the Hassan Tower in Morocco, being of similar earthy color and covered in ornate patterns of traditional Redguard architecture. Just outside the city of Tanith, you'll also find the estate of the Order of the Scarab. Here you'll be able to join the guild or just admire their armored cavalry and horseback archery prowess. The Knight are cavalry specialists, whether that be heavily armored chargers or horse-mounted archers. On their estate, they continue to breed pure Yakutan chargers and often perform tourneys with lances for practice and for the entertainment of Tanis people. Joining up with the Order would be done by seeking them out at their estate, and their quests would often be related to dealing with threats to Tanith. Also nearby Tanith, you'll find the Al Denobia tomb, which would look more or less the same as it did in Elder Scrolls Online, and be filled with secrets, dangers, and treasure. To the southeast of Tanith, you'll find a town called Roseguard, which was hit very hard by the Thalmor invasion. For the most part, the town is rebuilt, but did so prioritizing speed over style, meaning that the architecture here is a mere shadow of its former self. Buildings that still remain intact will look beautiful and ornate. In this town, you'll find a great one-handed skill trainer who fled as they saw the town crumble under the Thalmor attack. This Redguard man vowed to never run from battle again and dedicated the next 20 years of his life learning how to kill, sleeping in a tent just outside the town's gates to A, punish himself for his cowardly act, and B, make sure he is the first line of defense against any attacks in the future. To the northeast of Roseguard, you've got a large arid mountain area filled with pockets of brittle brush, the occasional cactus, and creatures such as ogres, desert wolves, and massive sun spiders. There's a town amidst the hills known as Corton Mont, which is a very competitive blacksmith industry and many markets selling trinkets crafted from everything mined from the nearby cabins. But there's plenty of dyed fabric shelters of various colors that have been set up here to protect travelers from the blistering sun. Unfortunately, a local crime gang has taken to extorting money from the town and you'll be able to get a quest to put an end to it. To the northeast of here, still in the mountains, we've got Carnver Falls, which, as the name suggests, will be built next to a giant waterfall. We want this one to be up really high with the water crashing down the mountain range into the deep below. In the past, not much happened here, but it has recently turned into a luxury escape for the only child of Tanith's queen, a daughter who will spend half her time in a lodge here with the balcony facing the finest views possible. Plenty of investment has gone into keeping her safe with many guards present whenever this princess visits. Obviously, this occurrence definitely makes you think, hmm, seems like the queen is spending quite carelessly, but the princess justifies the expense with the excuse that it helps her study and learn so that she may one day lead Tanith, and while this reason may not justify the cost, copious books and written pages in the princess's quarter point it to being true. To the northeast of the mountains, you'll find a region of desert grassland plains, perfect for tearing through on horseback with the Knights of the Scarab. The final forebear city on the game map is Rehad, and can be found in the very south corner of the map to the east of Hughes Bane, bordering with Cyrodiil and sharing bits of Imperial and Colovian inspired influence as a result. Such influence will be cultural but also architectural, so while Rehad will maintain many Redguard themes and religious motifs, it's a city we envision looking like a typical Hammerfell city if it was spliced with Anvil, the nearby city of Western Cyrodiil. You can imagine many of the structures being built with white stone materials, plenty of red-orange tiled roofs, and some sometimes even gold trim where the roof meets the top of the building's wall. Look at how Anvil was designed in Project Tamriel. Imagine a more red guard version of that. You can imagine this white stone material being used in traditional structures too, like a big red guard themed palace with two towers on both front corners, also built from the same stone as the rest of the city, but given the typical golden spherical tip. There will be plenty of trade at the city's port and in the city itself with sprawling bizarre marketplaces and more trade than most other cities in the game. You will find many people from Cyrodiil in Rehad, some who are friendly with stories to share and some who are ruthless and rude, wanting you to get out of their face and stop wasting their time so they can focus on making more coin. But it's not just travelers who are Imperial. 
You will find a significant portion of Rehad's domestic population to be Imperials compared to other Hammerfell cities. We really want them to be Kaluvian in feel, with pride in self-sufficiency, an emphasis on loyalty to one another, and a kind of straightforwardness that could be misconstrued by some as impolite. They'll be proud of who they are, and will favour each other over others when given the chance. Being much more cosmopolitan in nature, it's no surprise that Rehad is another forebears city. The temple here is quite impressive, serving as the main location of the Eight Divines religious faction talked about previously in the video. The temple will have shrines to the same eight divines that the Kaluvian people would worship, except some with red guard names, plus a few strictly red guard deities such as Hoonding and Leki. What will be quite interesting, however, is that the temple won't look as traditionally red guard as others from the outside. We envision it still with a gold-plated dome structure roof. However, it will be built from the same white stone material as other buildings in the city, and the aesthetic will be like a slightly smaller version, at least on the outside, of the Imperial City's Temple of the One. However, there's also another temple in Rehad, a smaller one, Imperial in design and operated by the Talos Cult faction. But not everyone is happy with the Imperial presence here. In fact, there have been times when worshippers of Satakal, the Yakutan god of everything, have gone nude in the city, rolling in the dirt and striking out at the legs of people walking by, nipping them as if they were snakes. They particularly liked harassing Imperial civil servants. Others were said to perform disgusting public acts of shame shedding their skin. They were run out of cities for safety reasons, but I'm sure the sentiment will remain and we can see some crazed Sadakar followers who are doing some weird things to disturb and bother certain important Imperials. Though by the time our game takes place, the Clovians have such a strong foothold in the city that they won't be deterred easily. Speaking of Imperial influence, we also thought it would be very cool to have a quest where the Empire can full on take control of part of Hammerfell, annexing Rehad. We would have a character from Elder Scrolls Blades, a red guard named Prince Dinahan al Rihad, make a return, attempting to claim the throne. He is an imperial loyalist and was forced to forfeit his throne and was granted asylum in Cyrodiil in the 180th year of the Fourth Era. Wearing Cyrodiilic ebony armor trimmed with gold, he's competed in arenas to train his combat skills and has active intentions to retake the throne. By the time our game is set, he will be about 40 or 50 years old, grizzled and strong, ready to get what he thinks is rightfully his. He has since amassed a force of fighters and by doing quests for him you can help him take over. Or you can help the current leader of Rehad to take the fight to Prince Dinahan and remove him from the face of Tamriel. The area around the city will be like dry lands, prone to forest fires and looking like a slightly more arid version of Cyrodiil's Gold Coast. You'll find more creatures common to Cyrodiil in the environment too. River trolls will live in the southern areas of the Brenner River and to the east you'll be able to find mountain lions and boars, even a dreg or a willow the wisp in rare circumstances. Not too far from Rehad is the ruined fortress known as Stonekeep, which once housed a group of peacekeeping knights until it was overrun by a group of goblins controlled by a necromancer. You'll also be able to explore nearby villages like Chaseguard, a quiet town to the northwest of Rehad, and Stonemore if you follow the mountains northeast, which has been having some reported problems with ghostly entities. Continuing around to the north, there's some large cliff structures and a town called North Hall, situated in a spot of relatively barren terrain. This Fort Town has a large keep which has been used historically for the kings and queens of Rehad to retreat to in times of severe threat to the city. It's also been used as a safe haven for other high-ranking court members. There will be a strong guard presence here and plenty of happy town dwellers who appreciate the additional security that their town is lucky to have. On the other side of the mountains here and into the plains to the north, you'll find plenty of agriculture and farming focused around a place known as Volknu Town. Moving up into the Craglawn region, we have Ellen here, a major city situated amongst the small mountain area that exists near the borders of both Cyrodiil and Skyrim. This crown city is built upon an ancient Nedic settlement, which is still visible today through the tall apex towers. Having remnants of Nedic architecture in Ellen here would be incredibly cool, seeing as old Nedic ruins are a rare sight across all of Tamriel. Some of the architecture among the houses that people live in will also be slightly more Cyrodiilic, and there will be more of a stone city vibe to it in general. Some citizens here are said to have a bit more of a Colovian style when it comes to fashion and taste, but like any city existing in Hammerfell, especially one run by the Crown's leadership, things will still appear quite clearly Red Guard influenced. You will have temples and statues dedicated to Yakutan gods, and the palace here will have been built to look more traditional compared to some of the other architecture, so still expect to see some traditional Yakutan wall engravings and other Middle Eastern inspired structures of ornate design. If you listened to the faction 
questions sections, you'll also remember that Ellen here is the City of Magic. Here you'll find the Circle of Magi faction explained in the factions section, and you can visit them in their main apex tower. The outside of these towers may appear needic, but inside they will be incredibly different. Magical trinkets and tools will be everywhere, and the rooms will be filled with mesmerizing colors, carpets, and Persian-inspired intricate architecture. Also, keep in mind, Ellen here will be run by a prince, as his father, the king, is very sick and currently sustained by magic. What's also fascinating about Ellen here is that during the First Era, when Hammerfell was part of the Second Empire, there were sewer works constructed under the city. We think this could be a really cool place to explore, with all kinds of things hiding down there. Around Ellen here in the rocky landscape of the Craglorn region, you'll find creatures such as dune races, giant scorpions, and Welwar. You may see foxes running about, even wild camels. A few Nedic ruins can be found in the area, and to the south of Ellen here you'll find a village named Stonedale. A profitable sapphire mine operates here, and merchants from Cyrodiil and Skyrim sometimes make the trek to buy materials which they can take back home and sell for an easy profit. Northeast of Ellen here you'll find another settlement called Nimble Moor, a foresty, simple woodcutter's village, who have a kind of pseudo-leader, a Breton alchemist who lives there and has always used her wisdom to advise them in times of need. The alchemist has a shop you can buy potions and poisons from, and a dark secret you'll stumble upon if you go searching through her belongings. Even further from here, you'll come to Belkarth, which is a much larger settlement with plenty of shops, an inn, guard barracks, and a small palace. We'd like it to stay home to expert astronomers that continue the Nedic worship of the Celestials. Depending on which way you head from the town, you'll find plenty of trees, grass, or rocky cliff sides, both of which will have quite the bandit presence, keen on looting travelers, or even a whole town if the opportunity would arise. Now let's take ourselves all the way to the top of the map, the most northern city in Hammerfell, and a very well-known one at that, Dragonstar. Dragonstar is still in the Craglorn region, sitting at the foothills of the Dragontail Mountains. It is a crown city, but due to its history and its location near the borders of Hyrok and Skyrim, it can't help but be very cosmopolitan compared to other parts of Hammerfell. A huge variety of races will be found here, and a very cool blend of cultural themes will be present. During the War of Bendemark, the Nords of Skyrim besieged the city, setting up a government and controlling the east side, with Hammerfell still controlling the western side. This means that you're going to see a big mix of Nordic and Red Guard architecture. There may be slight tensions between the most nationalistic members of the two races, but for the most part the races of the city don't bother each other, as much as some might carry a deep distaste hidden on the inside. In Dragonstar you'll meet nobles from High Rock, and even warriors from Skyrim who have come to compete in the city arena. The arena isn't some gigantic grand structure like that of the Imperial City, but it still attracts enough challenges from around the place to host various battles each week. You'll be able to fight and compete here yourself, and even place some bets if you fancy yourself lucky. But what's interesting about Dragonstar is the problem the city is having with the nearby orcs. The fourth Orsinium is alive and gaining strength. Outside of the city and to the west, you will find the estate of the Order of Diagna, who are working with the King of Dragonstar to fend off attacks from Orsinium. You'll be able to help this faction and eventually take the fight to the orcs, or perhaps you will end up helping the orcs defend against such an assault. Orsinium can be found in the mountains between Hammerfell and Skyrim, and was explained in more depth in the faction section. To the southeast of Dragonstar you can find the village known as Dragongate, which is even closer to Orsinium, which is just to its east. Here you can find a highly militarized village constantly battling against raids from Orsinium, thankfully with help from the city of Dragonstar. If we head south through the mountains, we'll arrive at a location known as Fang Lair. This was once a Dwemer city, and over the eras it has become a place of historical significance. When our game is set, you may venture deep into these ruins, potentially finding one of the only dragons in the entire game. South Southwest of Dragonstar and below the Dragontail Mountains, we'll be able to find the town known as Heldorn Mount. Over the years, Heldorn Mount was put on the map for a lot of travelers as it gained quite a reputation for strength competitions. Travelers from all over would come here to compete in a variety of feats of strength to win strongman competitions and to make a name for themselves. If attributes feature in Elder Scrolls 6 and you've got high strength, perhaps you'll find yourself among the competitors. Nearby in the Dragontail Mountains is the Reachman mentioned in the faction set Section when we talked about lycanthropes. Here there will be a small shrine to her scene and the ability to purchase a variety of lycanthrope enhancing items. And finally we come to Skaven, southwest of Dragonstar and the most central main city on the map. Skaven is another crown's controlled location existing in a dusty badland region of the map. The queen here is incredibly traditional and stubborn, being distrusting of magic and faithful in the old ways. However, while doing the Circle of Magi questline, you'll be able to convince her to trust the guild and their ways, giving you a spot 
spot here with your own private tower. The city will reflect her orthodox attitude, with temples dedicated to the most ancient Yakutan deities and a very high red guard population. Many of the city folk here will feel quite stoic, and they take their traditions and ceremonies very seriously, taking great pride in their history and customs. Within Skaven you'll also find the Dragon Star Caravan Company, who you will be able to do quests for, helping them ensure the safe transfer of goods to a little known mountain settlement to the north. Don't expect things to go smoothly. In the countryside near the city you can find the local hall of Virtues of War, where sword singers trained long ago. Now these halls will exist almost as a museum to visit for those interested, but also for aspiring swordsmen who wish to partake in the history and traditions of old Yakutan warriors, practicing their training. On the northern outskirts of the city are the caverns of rye, filled with herds of scav bats who are bred by farmers to produce bat cheese, which apparently goes well with pomegranate wine. Also near Skaven are many old Yakutan ruins, one of which hides the headquarters of our Assassin's Guild, the Salatep. Helen's Stand can also be found in the region around Skaven, which was once a massive ancient Yakutan city, still enduring to this day, but now inhabited by a much smaller population. Its population was diminished long ago as the port cities of Hammerfell gained prominence due to easy access to trading with outsiders. Other neighboring settlements include Cliffkeep, Riverpoint, and Verkarth City. Verkarth City was once ruled by a king vampire who commanded an army of werewolves and other vampires known as the Grey Host. Silver weaponry is quite popular here, sold to travelers and citizens who live under the fear that one day vampires could return. This fear is, for the most part, unfounded, but promoted to sell more weapons. To the northeast of Skaven, you'll find Cliff Keep, a town overlooked by, as the name suggests, a small keep built onto a cliff. The cliff is quite low as far as cliffs go, but you still wouldn't want to fall off the top. The leader of the town resides here, surveying everything from above with a handful of guards who ensure daily life runs smoothly. There's plenty of stalls here selling different bits and pieces that you might find at a general goods store. And finally, to the southeast of Skaven, we have River Point hiding all the way down in the grassy region near Volcanoo Town. Riverpoint will be another agricultural town with loads of farming and a water mill used to grind grain. With the map explained, we would like to talk briefly about weapons and gear, what we would like to see and how it would all work. For starters, we'd like to see the layered armor system that appeared in Morrowind and was later implemented into Fallout 4. We think this kind of system where you can mix and match all kinds of pauldrons, gauntlets, greaves, helmets and so on, it gives you much more of an aesthetic freedom to create a truly unique character and it allows you to give yourself some signature flair. If we couldn't do that, we would at the very least enjoy the ability to have wraps, scarves, veils, hoods, turbans, robes, and so on worn over armor, creating that perfect battle mage, assassin, or desert traveler look. It would also help distinguish certain characters or types of guard without having to change their entire armor set. Additionally, regarding jewelry, we would love for there to be additional cosmetic options, including earrings, nose piercings, and of course, the traditional rings, amulets, and so on. But piercings along with tattoos in particular would make a great fit for Hammerfell considering the corset and pirates, the African and Middle Eastern influences, and the existence of various Hammerfell subcultures, kingdoms, tribes, orders, factions, etc. that could all utilize these various aesthetic markers to make them stand out. Before we move on to some general aesthetic ideas and potential influences, I want to call out the elephant in the room. Yes, we would want spears in the ideal Elder Scrolls 6 along with halberds, lances, and other polearm type weapons. It just makes sense. We would also like to have crossbows in the base game, and honestly, in general, we would like a nice variety of weapon types, and we do not just mean the material used, steel, glass, ebony, etc. We are talking about the classification of weapons. The primary and incredibly necessary addition would be scimitars, curved, swords. We need lots of them in various types of Daedric or a Calcum, etc. But at the same time, we don't want all the swords to be curved, so this is where distinct weapon categories like scimitars and long swords would be very useful. But now we have that out of the way, let's talk about the cultural influences, aesthetics, and motifs that would help define the Red Guard look. Aesthetically, Hammerfell and the Red Guards, as we have said, are incredibly influenced by North African cultures, such as the Tuaregs, Moroccans, Berbers, Egyptians, Libyans, as well as the Middle Eastern cultures, such as Persians, Arabians, Turkish, the Ottomans of the Ottoman Empire, perhaps some ancient Mesopotamian influences in there, and I'd say the Muslim world in general has its fair share of influence in Hammerfell. 
And as we've talked about in previous videos about IRL inspirations for Elder Scrolls, the cultural basis for Yakuda is Japan in terms of politics, societal structure, history, and events. However, it would be a neat idea to incorporate some East Asian type aesthetic for variety, but not like importing straight katanas into their culture. The Yakudan motifs in ESO already seem somewhat samurai inspired, but perhaps taking influences from real world cultures where East and West Asia met would be a really cool idea, such as areas encompassed by the Sassanid Empire, like Bactria, Sogdia, and Northwestern India. There is one aesthetic in particular included in ESO that I really like, and I would love for it to be in Elder Scrolls 6. If you look at the regatta motif, then you may notice it includes these wing-like spines of feathers built onto the back of the armor, giving it a more intimidating appearance. In game, this is a representation of their dedication to Tava, the air god. Well, in the real world, the people who are renowned for this are the winged hussars of Poland. ESO has done a great job with some armors and aesthetics, which when combined with some influences we have talked about, would really create a nice spread of armor, weapons, and clothing that is not all just turbans and scimitars. We think fantasy cultures are done best when there is a good mix of real world cultural influences rather than straight up importing fantasy versions of cultures into the games. To clarify, there's nothing wrong with basing a fantasy culture off certain real world cultures as a base, but when there is no flair, new ideas, or interesting mixes, it just seems unoriginal and can be rather stale. And now for the companions. Companions have never had a huge role in the Elder Scrolls series, but there's no reason why they can't have more attention. In Skyrim, there were a few companions with substance, like Sarana, but for the most part, there was a lot of quantity and not much quality when it came to depth and personality. Just like an ideal Fallout game, we desire Elder Scrolls 6 to have companions who are well connected to the world around you through factions and ideologies. Companions who will make you think about your choices and through your emotional connection with them, may shape you as much as you can also shape them, so instead of having over 50 different followers in the game, we'd prefer a cast of say 8 deep and well put together companions, all of which have their own unique desires, playstyles, quests, and philosophies. We think this would provide an Elder Scrolls game with a much richer experience. On top of this, we still want to keep some more generic followers to facilitate certain roleplaying experiences. Perhaps certain mercenaries are available for hire, or if you're the head of a guild such as our Assassin's Faction, there should still be those new recruits who you can command to travel with you things like that. You could have some pet companions available too, like an Imperial War Mastiff dog, for example, or maybe even a tamed hyena if they were to be in the game, or things like that. But generally, the idea here is to move the focus onto quality while retaining those same basic follower options if desired, but adding in some more true characters to be around. Companions who you'll grow super attached to and make many memories with. And Hammerfell in particular is in such a nice spot for a diverse cast of deep companion characters that would make sense being there there. You have High Rock to the north, with lots of trade along the Iliac Bay. You have Skyrim to the northeast. Hammerfell borders almost the entirety of Cyrodiil's western Clovian regions. The ports of the south would potentially bring trade and interaction with Valenwood and Somerset. You also have Orsinium built in the mountains between Hammerfell and Skyrim, so you have access to potential Orc companions. So with all of these foreign populations just over the borders, it would make sense to give us a rich cast of companions. For example, you could have a Clovian Baron from the Isle of Sturk who is hunting the man who kidnapped his wife and sold her to the Slowed. You could have an orc who was orphaned and adopted by a Redguard family in Dragonstar and now lives with one foot in each of the two worlds, conflicted by loyalty to his family and his desire for a true sense of belonging and connection to the Orzma people. You could have a High Elf pirate of Stross Mackay, who has spent the last 400 years raiding, thieving and plundering, taking advantage of any crisis, Daedric or Great War. He isn't a good fellow, but he would be an interesting character with a lot of history to talk about as he would have witnessed some of the most important events in the Elder Scrolls. You could have a shamed and dishonored Breton Knight who failed to protect his king and was forced to find work in Hammerfell. Perhaps you could help him regain his faith within himself and have him knighted in the Order of the Scarab or something like that. We already have some examples of characters in the faction section that would make great companions too, such as Caius Aurelian, the X-Blade member who is on a quest to revive the Swordsingers. He would be a faction specific companion of course, but overall you get the point. There is a wealth of opportunity for companions in Hammerfell, and we would love it if Bethesda gave them far more depth and attention, rather than providing endless but shallow options. And that brings us to the end of our ideal Elder Scrolls 6 Hammerfell. Thank you all so much for supporting our channel, and remember if you did enjoy the video, please leave a like and share it with your friends, 
or even with Bethesda. If you want to talk about your Elder Scrolls or Fallout game ideas with us, remember to pop into our next YouTube stream, which of course is announced on Michael's Twitter, linked below. If you want more of this content, you know which button to press. And remember, if you want some absolutely sensational Fudge Muppet logo merch that looks fresh as, and helps support us, click the link in the description. Thanks so much for tuning into Fudge Muppet. This is our favorite type of content to make, and it's only made possible by the support you give us. It's been Michael and Scott, and we look forward to nerding out with you again next time.